Liz, Bride's Dock on Portham Island, Book 4, written by Debbie Civil, narrated by Bethany Kay. Prologue. Marcus Lawson stood outside the office building that held Portham Mail Order Bride Services. Doubt and uncertainty swirled in his stomach, but what his friend James Parker said was true. Son, if you want more families to use your center, get a pretty wife that will host charity galas for you. Marcus had a lot of gold diggers clamoring for a chance to shackle themselves to him. He even had a lady lie about being pregnant five years ago. As soon as he had suggested that they could take another test together, the hysterical woman had grown angry, her hand viciously striking across his face. You think that I'm lying to you, Marcus? You don't trust me. In truth, he had trusted Rose and had considered making her his wife. Out of all of the women who dated him, she wasn't boring, clingy, or greedy, or so he thought. But that one act of cruelty caused Marcus to stay a bachelor, longing for someone that lit a fuse inside of him. Was the mail-order bride option a good one? In the heat of the moment, Marcus envied his brother for having a female to warm his bed and cook his meals. But as the sun beat down on him, his certainty was turning into indecisiveness. Marcus, you going to meet with Cassandra? Lance, Cassandra's business partner, inquired. Marcus's heart stopped, the other man startling him away from his mental debate. The prospective groom turned to face Lance, who was wearing khaki shorts and a button-down shirt, an outfit that was the exact replica of what Marcus dressed himself in that morning. Seriously, island fashions needed to be expanded. What do you think of the process? Marcus asked. Lance grinned. So far, so good. I think that Asher, Thomas, and Kendrick are pleased with their wives. If it's so great, why don't you send for a mail-order bride? Marcus challenged, at which Lance let out a chuckle. I am a candidate, but none of the brides that have applied are a good fit for me. Cassandra told me to trust the process. Besides, it isn't like we have any prospects. If we were going to get married, we would have been already. Lance had a point. There weren't many options on Portham Island, so with his nerves still dancing in his gut, the bachelor entered the office building. Two minutes into the interview, and Marcus felt like he was in the hot seat. He eyed Cassandra, whose expression was serious. She couldn't think that he could actually answer that sort of thing. What if the matchmaker gossiped? Come again? Marcus asked, hoping that he was wrong. Do you have any crazy exes? Overbearing parents or greedy siblings? Will my bride see my answers? Marcus demanded. Cassandra shook her head. Of course not. But I will determine how well she'll be able to cope with your situation by what you say. You're really going to make me admit that mom is overbearing? Then you're going to write it on paper? Cassandra, you can't be serious. She let out a sigh. Fine. Can you cook? She asked. No, I'm a disaster in the kitchen. Can my new bride be a chef? I swear the Lawson men have a curse, Marcus declared. Right, the infamous Lawson curse. Esperanza mentioned that one. But you didn't confirm if you had a crazy ex or not. Cassandra pointed out. No one that's invested in me, Marcus admitted. All of the women are obsessed with the Adams boys. Except for me, the wedding planner argued. I thought that you were interested in Lance, Marcus teased, wanting to get a reaction out of the woman. Lance, we're friends and that's it, Cassandra protested. Bad news for Lance, but good news for the men of Portham Island, Marcus replied. Nice try, Marcus Lawson. You won't escape my questions. So, what kind of woman are you looking for? 
Someone that will cook, clean, and host my events? She has to be a good conversationalist and isn't overbearing, Marcus listed. My mother already tries to run my life. I don't need another person interfering. Anything else? Cassandra wondered. Hmm, she has to like children. I plan on adopting an orphan or two once we get to know each other, he revealed. Cassandra nodded. I think I can work with what you gave me, Cassandra assured. I'll let you know once I've found your match. Thanks, Cassandra. I hope you find her soon, Marcus said before walking out of the room. Marcus, a shrill voice screeched. Of course, Emma Adams would make herself a nuisance when Marcus was two blocks away from entering his air-conditioned home. He turned to face Emma, his chest tightening when his eyes landed on her. She looked like she was just about to give birth. Perspiration dripped down her forehead and her red hair was up in a messy bun. The loose silk dress she wore was a far cry from the short, skimpy outfits that she favored. Her face tilted up in a harsh grin, causing dread to fill Marcus's chest. So, Asher has a wife now, Emma noted. And you're married and about to have a baby, Marcus pointed out. It's hot and muggy and I am a block from home. You want me to point out any more obvious facts? Did you tell Asher? The sparkle in Emma's eyes made Marcus stiffen. One mistake in this broad had something over his head. Marcus wished that he could blame alcohol on his poor decisions, but the only thing he had been drunk on was lust. No. Why would I? Because you're an honest businessman, Emma taunted. How much do you want? Marcus demanded, knowing that money would be enough to shut Emma up. The last thing he wanted to do was cause his family embarrassment. I want out, Emma cried. Brad is dreadfully boring, and I don't want to be a mother. If you can make that happen, I won't say a word. So this broad thought that he was a genie? Crap, if Marcus was going to warp reality, he would have invented the perfect wife. I'll see what I can do, Marcus said. You better make it happen, or Asher will be receiving a tape. Emma threatened before waddling away. Chapter One Who knew a history debate could get someone canned, Liz Sanders thought as she stormed out of the diner. It had only been less than two weeks and she was unemployed. That wasn't good news since she was the only breadwinner. Her sister Nancy had gotten divorced and spent most of her days on her laptop. She claimed that she was doing research on some ways to earn cash. Liz couldn't help but think that getting a job would have been a better use of her sister's time. But Nancy had broken into hysterics the last time Liz tried voicing her opinion. It looks like I'll need to fire up that old laptop, Liz thought, before brushing sweat from her forehead. It was freaking hot outside. Liz approached her apartment building, wishing that Essie were still around. The woman was much better at dealing with Nancy's antics. Liz would have gone back to North Dakota, but her mother had wanted her to leave so that she could spend time with her new husband. Running to her deadbeat father wasn't an option either. She lost touch with him five years ago and so didn't have contact information for him. Damn it, if only she hadn't corrected someone on the date of the signing of the Magna Carta, she would still be a waitress. Who knew that the pompous jerk would have found a fence? Liz used her key to enter the building and walked to one of the first floor units. She frowned when she twisted the knob, surprised that the door was unlocked. It was broad daylight, so Liz supposed that it wasn't that big of a deal. She entered and frowned at what she saw. A tall man with glasses stood in her living room, with the couch behind his legs. It was as if he had just gotten onto his feet. He pulled a gun that was obscured by a couch cushion and pointed the weapon at her. Fear drove Liz's instincts. She quickly dove to the floor as the first shot went off. 
The bullet slammed into the section of wall that was just a foot from where she had been standing. The trajectory of the bullet made the frightened woman draw one conclusion. The guy was a bad shot. His next poorly aimed shot confirmed her hypothesis, when the bullet made the screen of the TV explode. Liz felt sort of optimistic, especially when the man's gun jammed. She knew that turning her back on the man wasn't a great idea. But something occurred to her. He wore thick glasses. She wondered what his vision would be like without them. Her co-worker Susie had given Liz a welcome present. The woman was a huge baseball fan and thought that Liz would enjoy having a softball that was engraved with her name. She hadn't known what to do with it. Liz had played softball in high school but wasn't spectacular enough to get a scholarship. But she knew that she was good enough to make the shot. As the man continued to attempt to fire the weapon, she pulled the softball from her purse, stood, and tossed it with all that she had. His glasses shattered, the ball slamming into his eye. The man dropped the gun and fell backwards, his hands covering his face. Liz took the opportunity to snatch up the discarded gun. Stay right there, she ordered. I'm going to call the police. The man didn't move. He was obviously in too much pain. Sighing in relief, she pulled her cell phone from her purse and ran from the apartment. After closing the door behind her, she placed the gun on the ground and rested her foot on top of it. Then she called 911. 911, what's your emergency? The male dispatcher yelled. An intruder is in my apartment? He tried to shoot me, but I broke his glasses with my softball. He dropped the gun and... The dispatcher interrupted her in order to get information on her whereabouts. She was instructed to leave the premises, and she did, after tucking the gun into her purse. Liz sat on a bench outside her building, terrified that the man would regroup. Yes, she had dealt him a devastating blow, but he could always ditch the gun and attack with another weapon. The police had better hurry up. Marcus eyed Cassandra, who was running toward him. So she found someone for him. After his run-in with Emma, Marcus wasn't sure if getting married should be on his radar. But it wasn't like he could withdraw his application. He leaned against the door to the processing center and smiled at the woman. It was Marcus's turn to close, and he was exhausted. Marcus, Cassandra said through a gasp. Good news. I found a bride for you. Great. Now, take a few deep breaths. I'm not going anywhere. Marcus teased. Cassandra bent over, her hands on her knees. When this business takes off, I need to invest in a horse. Or you could just call people cell phones, Marcus suggested. No, that takes the magic out of things, Cassandra insisted. You already have to call the brides, why not call the grooms as well? Cassandra shot him a scowl. (sighs) I found your match. Her name is Liz Sanders, she reported. Liz Sanders, Marcus asked, testing the name. I never saw myself with an Elizabeth, Marcus noted. It isn't Elizabeth, it's just Liz, Cassandra corrected. Okay, when is she coming? Marcus asked, feeling a bit queasy. When he was eating his sister-in-law's cooking, a mail-order bride sounded good. Now that he was bringing a stranger into his house, he didn't feel confident in his decision. If all goes to plan, she will arrive on Saturday. You mean the day of my brother's surprise wedding? Marcus asked. I know, it's sudden, but Dana already had to fly to Canada to retrieve Esperanza's aunt. She'd rather get this over with than take a few days off, Cassandra explained. Esperanza hasn't run into her aunt yet? Marcus asked, curious. Nope, we've been able to keep them apart. I expect that you'll clean your place for your bride? Cassandra said, her eyes hard. Yeah, whatever, I just... 
I have to give my mother a heads up. Marcus groaned before walking the two short blocks to his abode. Marcus lived in a two-story home that was painted a light blue. He had a porch swing and a barn which didn't currently hold a horse. He was still dragging his feet on purchasing one since he wanted to donate 50 horses to the orphanage before getting one for himself. The beach was a two-minute walk from his home. He could smell the seawater that lingered in the air. He enjoyed taking swims at sunset, but that night he had to deal with a certain headstrong woman. His mother was waiting for him in her favorite spot on his porch swing. She smiled at him as he sat beside her. You're late, she accused. Cassandra stopped me on my way home. It turns out that my wife is coming tomorrow, Marcus said. Oh, great, a double wedding, how delightful. Mom, I'm not doing that to Asher. Don't be ridiculous. Asher would love to see his baby brother married now that the matter of your upcoming nuptials is settled. I've come to go over everything with you, Mom announced. Yes, Mom, I delivered the invitations last week. Everyone can make it. Oh, and the Reverend is available to marry them again, even though they are already married, Marcus pointed out. You forgot one, his mother warned. I made sure to tell Brad that his wife is not welcome at the event, Marcus assured. Well, he hadn't said it quite like that since all of Brad's brothers were at the bar. He simply told the man to keep Emma occupied. Marcus suspected that the man was embarrassed by his wife's behavior. Good, and don't forget to pick up your suit tomorrow, she said before getting to her feet. Marcus, you better clean every surface of your house. You don't want to scare off your new bride. If she is as fertile as Esperanza, you'll want to keep her. Conceiving a child on the island took longer for some couples. He couldn't believe that his mother had turned around so quickly. Asher had been given a lot of grief for signing up for Cassandra's mail-order bride service. Why don't you help me, Mom? Marcus brightly said. You'll know what she wants. His unimpressed mother rolled her eyes. I have to go home to cook for my husband. Do as I say, she ordered before leaving. Marcus loved his mother, really, he did. But he couldn't help but resent her for refusing to cook for him. She knew that he was cooking challenged and didn't seem to care. Maybe his wife could teach him how to cook in a crock pot. Marcus stormed into his bachelor pad and felt overwhelmed. He wasn't going to get this place an order in a day. Dishes filled both sinks, his counters were food-stained, and the floor had sand and dirt everywhere he stepped. Marcus was going to dig into his house fund to get a maid. He sure hoped that his mail-order bride was worth it. Chapter 2 Liz paced the carpeted floor of her surprisingly clean motel room. The apartment that she shared with her sister was a crime scene, so Liz had to scrounge up money to stay elsewhere. The place had two beds, which was good. Nancy would need somewhere to stay after the police finished interviewing her. Liz wasn't sure why they bothered. Her sister had been shopping at the mall during Liz's attack. At least Nancy hadn't been caught up in that horribly random assault. Life was funny that way, Liz thought. The woman, who had spent every day for a week on the computer, managed to go to the mall and search for a job just in time to avoid an intruder. Her phone rang. She hit the answer button, then tossed herself onto one of the double beds. Is this Liz Sanders? An unfamiliar female voice asked. It is, Liz said, her interest piqued. She didn't think that it was a dreaded robocall, and she had no bills due. This is Cassandra Hall, your matchmaking coordinator, she announced. So the mail-order bride company had decided to call her. Out of curiosity, Liz had filled out the questionnaire and sent it back along with a spit sample. 
She hadn't been sure if anything would come of it. In the end, Liz realized that nothing could be lost by putting in an application. Besides, this supposed matchmaking agency had been Esperanza's ticket out. I found you a match. He lives off the coast of Florida, Cassandra brightly announced. Liz was waiting for the other woman to add that for a fee of $250, his identity would be revealed. But all she heard was silence. Oh, right, it was her turn to speak. Oh, um, so you guys aren't a scam? Liz blurted out, which was ridiculous. After all, hadn't Esperanza told Nancy that she was happily married and expecting a child? No. Are you interested in moving to Florida? Cassandra inquired. Let's see. I'm about to become homeless unless I get a job. I was nearly killed by an intruder and... There was a brisk knock on the door. Hang on, I have a visitor. Liz glanced through the peephole and recognized Officer Knight, the kind man who had taken her statement. She opened the door and smiled at him. Liz, the case has been solved. We got two confessions, he reported. Two? Only one man attacked me, she argued, unhappy with the possible lazy detective work. If you come with me, I'll explain, the man said. No, I think I like it here better. I'm tired and you caught the guy. Besides, I'm on the phone with a matchmaker and... I can't force you to come with me, but maybe you'll change your mind when I explain things to you. Your sister hired the intruder, James Nelson, to kill you. James was told that he would get a cut of the forged insurance policy that Nancy took out on you. To ensure that he could use blackmail to keep Nancy honest after the crime was committed, he taped all of their planning sessions. I don't even think that this is going to trial, but I can't be sure. The prosecutor will want to speak to you tomorrow. If... I'm moving to Florida. I'm getting married. Do you really need me? It sounds like a slam dunk. Liz quickly replied, her heart racing. She wanted to be alone. No, her sister couldn't have tried to kill her for money. This couldn't be true. But she reminded herself that James Nelson had the entire thing on tape. So, of course it was true. Liz, are you all right? Cassandra asked, her concerned voice reaching Liz through the phone. My sister wanted to kill me, Liz said, her tone flat. My older sister wanted to kill me for money. Ma'am, I do recommend that you speak with our district attorney. He'll know. Thank you. For all of your work, you are a hero, and I respect you. I just... I'm leaving to get married. I want to get on with my life. Tell the district attorney that he can offer Nancy a deal for all I care. I just... Someone wanted me dead. Just go, she pleaded. The officer nodded before leaving Liz alone. As soon as the door closed, Liz tossed herself on the bed and began weeping. Now that the officer was gone, she truly allowed herself to fall apart. Cassandra was there through it all, never leaving her alone. Liz, Cassandra softly said after a second, I can send the private jet to pick you up tomorrow. That would be nice. You want a jet? Liz weakly asked. One of my business partners owns the jet. Do you have all of your clothes with you? I wasn't allowed to take anything. I don't think I want to go back there, Liz admitted. That's all right. I will arrange for someone to pack your things. Which bedroom is yours? Cassandra wanted to know. Most of my stuff is in suitcases. I never brought myself to unpack after leaving North Dakota. My stuff is in the second bedroom, the one that doesn't have pictures of Nancy everywhere, she said. Her sister was the narcissistic sort who had selfies of herself framed and mounted to the walls of her bedroom. Okay, Liz, make sure you get some sleep. 
Luckily, one of my business partners is in town. She will pick up your things and meet you at your motel. Cassandra made all of the arrangements. An hour later, there was another knock on the door. Liz opened the door to a beautiful woman with chocolate skin, long black hair, and a gentle smile. I'm Sadie, Cassandra sent me, the stranger explained. Liz was so relieved that she didn't have to spend the night alone that she hugged the other woman whose embrace was firm. Don't worry. Before buying my yacht, I was in the military. I will keep you safe, Sadie assured her. It took ten minutes for Sadie to get settled in. Liz happily went through the suitcases that the other woman had dragged into the motel after their embrace. The shell-shocked bride-to-be gladly took a shower and changed into a tank top and shorts. She sat on the edge of one of the beds and Sadie handed her a buffalo chicken salad, her favorite. Sadie dined on a turkey club with fries. Liz made conversation while they ate. So, Sadie, tell me about yourself. Liz urged. There's not much to tell. I grew up with two loving parents. I joined the military right after college. After that, I bought a yacht. People pay me to take them on the ocean. It's nice work, unless someone does something stupid, Sadie said. Like what? Liz eagerly asked. Someone thought it would be a brilliant idea to bring firecrackers on my yacht? Luckily, I stopped them before they could light the first one. She replied, which made Liz chuckle. Random fact, I always wanted to be a history teacher, Liz admitted. But my family doesn't have money and my mother has bad credit, so she couldn't co-sign a loan for me, Liz admitted before continuing to eat her salad. What historical figure do you like? Sadie asked. Commodus, Liz enthusiastically declared. Who? Okay, I know that he isn't as popular as Augustus, but that Roman emperor was a hot mess. Did you know that Commodus actually fought in the Colosseum? He was a gladiator. Liz explained, her eyes shining with excitement. Weren't gladiator slaves? Sadie asked, puzzled. They were, but to gain favor with the people, Commodus decided that he would fight. He defeated many, though he cheated. Liz said. How? Sadie wondered, seeming to be interested. And that's what Liz loved. The moment that someone went from listening out of social politeness to finding her story fascinating. Well, he had one of his servants dull the blades of the gladiators. It was pretty much a slaughter when Commodus fought, she reported. Sadie's eyes went wide. You can't be serious, she protested. I can. Obviously, his inner circle found out about it. Uh, it is believed that one of the gladiators that he freed assassinated him. Who else do you find interesting? Bloody Mary. You heard her story, right? Liz asked. Sadie shook her head. I probably learned about her in history, but I usually studied, took tests, and promptly forgot about the material. <laughs> she confessed. Liz was appalled by the woman's admission. It was likely that Sadie's history teacher hadn't taught the subject in an engaging manner. Liz knew that if she ran her own classroom, her students would be sitting on the edge of their seats, anticipating the next history lesson. After telling Sadie about Bloody Mary, Joan of Arc, and King Xerxes, Liz decided that it was time to watch TV. She avoided the fictional programs and chose to watch a crime documentary. Sadie arched a brow but didn't comment on the choice. Liz tucked herself into bed, trying to relax. Tomorrow is going to be different, she told herself. You will forget about Nancy, marry your groom, and live happily ever after. Chapter 3 Liz barely slept that night. But was she expected to sleep? Not only had her sister tried to kill her, but she was getting married. And to think she hadn't even had the chance to buy a wedding dress. Oh, well, it wasn't like her groom was going to care. Sadie was already awake and dressed. 
The room smelled like coffee and bacon. Liz quickly showered and changed into a casual dress and sandals. She figured that the outfit would be comfortable enough. After strolling back into the hotel room, Sadie gestured to the desk. Eat. I picked up breakfast for you, she said. Liz plopped down and happily took a sip of the coffee. Black, the way you like it. How do you know that I like my coffee black? Liz asked before popping a piece of bacon into her mouth. You mentioned it while we were talking about your days at the diner, Sadie reminded her. Liz nodded before cutting off a bite of the chocolate chip pancakes. This meal was scrumptious, but high in calories. She'd have to work it off later. Liz hadn't eaten so well in days. After finishing off her breakfast, the women loaded up the town car that took them to the airport. Hi, Liz, I'm Cassandra, your... Liz wrapped her arms around the taller woman, unable to verbally express her gratitude. She pulled away from Cassandra and grinned. Cassandra, thank you. I was alone and didn't have anyone, and you were there for me, Liz said. You were not just my mail-order bride coordinator. You're my friend. Cassandra's dark eyes filled with warmth. Likewise, Liz. Now come on. We have to get you to a safe place, Cassandra said as she led her down the aisle of the private jet. The two women sat in the row of seats across from Sadie. Liz happily buckled in, waiting to be taken away. So, ladies, do any of you have husbands? Liz asked. No, no, both women said as the plane took off. Liz was still nervous about flying private. She was sure that the pilot Dana and the co-pilot Sam were qualified. After all, they were Sadie's sisters. Liz had found it fascinating that Sadie was one of three. The three were identical to most, but Liz was confident that she had their names and faces figured out. I don't think I want to get married for another 20 years or so, Sadie admitted. I love my yacht too much. I want to get this matchmaking business off the ground. So far, I have matched a couple of women. It's... Esperanza was one of the brides, right? Liz asked excitedly. Cassandra smiled. Yes, she's happily married to the brother of your fiancé, Cassandra confirmed. Cassandra, get out of town. Essie for her sister-in-law? This adventure keeps on getting better and better. Wait, Essie told my sister that she was pregnant. Is that true? Liz asked hopefully. She only wanted the best for her future sister-in-law. Yes, Cassandra said. So, Liz, we need to talk about Portum Island, Cassandra said. What about the island? Uh, is there a community college where I can study history? I really want to be a history teacher. I'd love to learn about Portum Island's history. I didn't have a chance to Google it, I just... Liz, Cassandra firmly said. Yeah? Liz asked, confused. You're speaking way too fast. So much energy for so early in the morning, Cassandra teased. I have energy at all times of the day. Ask Essie, she'll tell you. Liz enthusiastically confirmed. There are some courses you can take on Portum Island's history, Cassandra assured the beaming bride. Is there anything else you're interested in? Criminal justice, but I think that's a new passion. I want to help people the way you two have helped me, Liz confessed. That can be done. You could work at my mail-order bride business. Maybe you could target people that need a place to stay. Cassandra said. Sounds great. Would I have to take courses? The bride inquired. Probably. I'd recommend a few basic courses, but it shouldn't be a problem. You're a breath of fresh air. Cassandra gushed. What kind of courses would I have to take? Liz inquired. A few psychology courses, a homemaking course, and probably an active listening course. Cassandra listed. Goodness, the Port of Island Community College offers an active listening course. Maybe my mother should take that one, Sadie joked. What's your mother like? Liz asked. 
Well, she's nice enough. She just doesn't like the lies that her daughters are living. If she had her way, we'd be married and pregnant. A lot of the island men are angry with us. There are more men than women. Really? How strange, Liz commented. No wonder why you guys needed your mail-order brides not to be on birth control. Since I'm too broke to afford it, I didn't see a problem with it. The rest of the flight went smoothly. They talked about mundane things, movies, and, of course, history. So, Cassandra said as they were sitting on the deck of Sadie's yacht. Dana was sitting with the women reading a book. Sam had decided to keep Sadie company. So what's next? Liz wondered as her eyes admired the ocean. Who knew that a broke kid from North Dakota would be enjoying such luxury? The only thing that was missing was her mother. Once she was settled, Liz swore that she would call her mother. She just didn't look forward to telling her about Nancy. There is something we didn't tell you, Cassandra said. There are many things you didn't tell me. Hello, Cassandra, we just met. By the way, can I call you Cassie? Liz wanted to know. Yes, that will be fine. Liz, Portham Island is surrounded by a barrier. In a few moments, you're going to feel static electricity on your skin, the matchmaker warned. Liz figured that Cassie was trying to pull a prank on her. So she simply kept on staring at the ocean. That's the reason why we required a sample of your DNA. Cool. Liz absentmindedly said. Before Cassandra could say anything else, Liz felt a blanket of electricity wrap around her. She let out a surprised yell as the electricity intensified. When darkness filled her vision, she panicked. Holy crap! Liz shrieked. I warned you, Cassandra said as the darkness faded and the electricity dissipated. What was that? Liz demanded. The barrier around Portham Island, Cassandra explained as the yacht soared toward an island. Wow, that's beautiful, Liz exclaimed, enchanted by her new home. Twenty minutes later, Liz was pushing a cart down the streets of Portham Island with her matchmaking coordinator by her side. Liz was okay with the whole no cars thing. She would just have to get used to seeing people riding horses down the street. At least some people were riding bicycles. The streets were wide enough for two horses to travel side by side. Did Marcus have a horse? That would be the first question Liz would ask her future husband. If he were an equestrian enthusiast, he'd need to give her riding lessons. Eventually, they reached a large two-story house that had a porch swing. Here we are. Cassandra said with a grin. Where is here? Liz asked, confused. This is your new home, Cassandra said, which made Liz's brow arch. Bet it's so huge, she protested. You are marrying Marcus Lawson, Cassandra said in answer. That family is loaded. I can't go through with this, Liz said. Me and rich people don't get along. I mean, I... Money, I, I can't. Nancy tried the whole rich thing and... Honey, take a breath. Cassandra coached. You'll be fine. Think about this. Esperanza is in this family. You know her. She isn't stuck up or pretentious. Okay, I'll try it. Liz said as the door opened and a handsome man descended the porch steps. He was tall with a muscular frame, dark brown eyes, black hair, and smooth olive skin. As soon as they made eye contact, Liz could barely breathe. His good looks and his home were overwhelming her. Is this my bride, Cassandra? He asked with a grin. Sure is. Liz, this is Marcus. Marcus, this is Liz. I can't. Liz said as visions of her sister began flashing through her mind. It finally hit her. Her older sister tried to kill her. She was on some random island about to marry a man she didn't know. Her parents didn't know where she was. When he got to know her, he would hate her. She had to get a grip. 
Sorry, I'm a bit frazzled. Yesterday a hitman tried to kill me, you see. My sister forged my name on an insurance policy and tried to kill me so that she could collect on the policy. Obviously she didn't succeed, I just... Marcus pulled Liz into his arms and she felt so safe and warm that she began to break down. He rubbed her back as she wept. Liz tried to control her emotions, but they wouldn't stop. Liz was pretty sure that after this, Marcus would never want to marry her. So she might as well get everything off her chest. Chapter 4 Marcus had no idea that he was receiving a bride with so much baggage. One would think that Cassandra would have been considerate enough to inform him of Liz's issues. Really, the poor thing was still shaking. Marcus brushed his fingers through Liz's mahogany-colored hair. His heart clenched as she shuddered in his arms. Seriously, her sister tried to kill her for insurance money? It was difficult to fathom that someone could do that to their own blood. He loved Asher, and no dollar amount would be worth his brother's life. I'm going to give you guys a minute, Cassandra said. I got Liz a dress that she can wear to Asher's surprise wedding. Come in, Liz, let's get you settled, Marcus gently said. He released his bride and retrieved two of her worn suitcases. After his bride grabbed the third, they went into the home that they would share together. Do uh, you want to immediately move into a bedroom with me, or would you rather stay in a guest room? Marcus wondered. How about a guest room until I get to know you? Liz decided. Her words made sense. He didn't think that he could have a stranger sharing a bed with him. He led her upstairs to the bedroom beside his. Her eyes widened upon seeing the room. It's huge, she gasped. Marcus shook his head. It's normal size. You should see my parents' house. Their place is huge, Marcus said. I don't get it. Why would someone as handsome and successful as you need a mail-order bride? Liz wondered, which made Marcus grin. You think I'm handsome? He asked, which made his bride blush. Her blush caused his playful nature to rear its ugly head. He took the bag from her hand and placed it on the hardwood. Then he made eye contact with the woman. Liz, why did you need help being matched? You're beautiful, have an incredible personality, and you're sexy as hell. Those full lips are calling to me. Marcus spoke the truth. Her full lips were begging to be ravaged by his mouth. Liz squeaked. I look horrible. You can't kiss me yet. Besides, our first kiss can't happen here. Not when I look like this, I... Marcus leaned down and brushed a kiss to her forehead, which made her suck in a breath. So she was attracted to him. Well, that was a good start. Liz, I hope you don't mind that I got this dress for you. I figured that you wouldn't have the time to pick something out, Cassandra said as she strolled into the room, with a garment bag tossed over her shoulder. Great, Liz cheered. Marcus, you must leave so I can shower and change. I promise I'll be presentable for Asher's surprise wedding. Marcus didn't doubt that Liz would be presentable for the event. See you downstairs, baby, Marcus said. Before strolling out of the room, the anticipation already filling his chest. By the time his bride made it down the stairs, Marcus had already changed into a black suit and tie, and he had grudgingly put on a pair of black dress shoes. He was in the kitchen leaning against the kitchen island when Cassandra appeared. She was dressed in a purple dress that hugged her curves. Her black hair was straightened, and she wore gold sandals. Liz insisted on doing my makeup. Cassandra announced, as she shoved a few strands of hair from her face. Before Marcus could comment, Liz entered. She wore a seafoam green dress that was low-cut and knee-length. He had a view of her long legs. He walked over to his stunning bride and cupped her face. Wow, what a beauty, 
He complimented. Is this the moment you were planning for me to kiss you? She blushed. Marcus playfully puckered his lips, wanting her to wait for it. Then he kissed her cheek. I suppose I'll settle for that since you seem to not want to tell me when we are supposed to kiss. Come on, you two. We're going to be late, Cassandra said. By the time Marcus exited the house with his bride, the cart had been taken away. Cassandra walked a few feet behind them, probably to give them privacy. So, Marcus, what do you do for a living? Liz asked, interested. I work in a processing center. I technically own it, but I enjoy interacting with people, he confessed. I want to take a few history courses. I love history. Does Portum Island have an interesting history? We have a mysterious history, Marcus confessed. One day, uh, people woke up on this island, people who were unable to escape horrible situations. Most of them were gladiators, servants, slaves, and other oppressed people. That's why our population is diverse. You guys had gladiators here. Did they leave history behind? Liz asked. Yes, uh, we have a few museums. Since the life of a Portum Island resident is much longer than the average human, our history is well-preserved, he said. Shut up, Liz squeaked. How long do Portum Islanders live? You and I will both likely live for centuries, he said. Stop it. Are your great-grandparents still alive? Liz asked, curious. Uh, yes, they are in their 500s, he said, thinking that his great-grandmother, Talia, would love her exuberance. Stop it! I can't wait to talk to her, she said as the couple turned down a side street. He spotted a few well-dressed people walking up his mother's imposing driveway. It looks like we're two of the last arrivals, Marcus commented. Listen, Liz, my mother is going to be rude. She likes women with a backbone. Don't take her crap. Liz nodded. Got it, she said as they walked up the driveway. As soon as Marcus strolled into the house with his bride in tow, his mother scowled at him. Marcus, I told you to come an hour ago. What if your brother saw you in the street? She nagged. Then he would have assumed that we were dressed for our wedding. Liz brightly offered as Cassandra entered. His mother eyed the woman that he was holding hands with. Marcus, who is this? Catherine Lawson asked, her eyes hard. I'm Liz, your almost daughter-in-law. Your dress is fantastic. So, where is Esperanza? I know her. I can't believe that I'm going to see her again. Liz excitedly rambled. Do you ever stop talking? Marcus's mother asked. No, it's a part of my charm. <laughs> no, are you going to answer my questions? Liz playfully challenged. Or are you going to stand there and admire how wonderful Marcus and I look together? A booming laugh sounded from the other room. Catherine, I have to meet this one. Marcus's father, Darren, declared as he walked into the foyer. Hi, honey, I'm Darren, your future father-in-law. Hi, Darren, I'm Liz. Liz brightly introduced. Well, you are a cute one, Catherine grudgingly acknowledged. Marcus, go outside with your father. I'm going to spend some quality time with Liz. Marcus kissed his bride on the forehead before following his father out of the house. Liz eyed the other woman, who was gorgeous and sophisticated. Liz was sure that she was going to tell her that she wasn't welcome. Liz was used to that sort of speech. Margie, her sister's ex-mother-in-law, had given her the same speech. I like you, Marcus's mother confessed. You have a backbone. Now what happened? What do you mean? Liz asked, unable to hide her shock. Oh, dear, a mother always knows things. You look sad, she noted. Um, uh, my sister hired a hitman to kill me for the insurance money and... Liz bit her lip. Damn it, she wasn't going to cry. No, 
though she needed to concentrate and try to find the humor in it all. Well, she hired a man who could barely shoot, let alone aim a gun. I told the prosecutor that I didn't want to testify. I don't want anything to do with the case, Liz said. What do your parents think? Catherine asked her. I don't know. I doubt that Nancy has told my mother. And are you a coward, Liz? Catherine challenged. No, uh, I don't think I am, Liz stammered. Come on, Catherine said, tugging Liz into an opulent living room. As soon as Liz was sitting in a plush chair, her new mother-in-law left the room. She returned moments later with a cell phone in her grip. You are the sort with a good memory. Now tell me your mother's phone number. Catherine gave Liz the no-nonsense expression, and so she offered up the information. Marcus's mother dialed and handed Liz the phone. Get it over with. It will make you feel better. The other woman said, before sitting on the couch beside Liz. Chapter 5 Hello, who is this? Liz's mother's raspy voice gained from years of chain-smoking reached her. They hadn't left on the best of terms. How was she going to tell her? Hi, Mom, it's Liz. I'm borrowing someone's phone, Liz explained. Why, what happened to your phone? Did you forget to pay the bill? No, Mom, I... well... Mom, Nancy is in trouble... She hired a hitman to kill me. The guy was waiting for me in the apartment. She's lucky he was a bad shot. I escaped and... How do you know that Nancy hired him? Her mother coldly challenged. The hitman taped their conversations in case Nancy didn't give him a cut of the insurance money, she said. I see. Where are you now? Her mother asked. Oh, great. Now it's time to tell your mother that you're about to marry a complete stranger, Liz thought to herself. I'm in Florida. I'm getting married today. You know, I'm starting a new life, Liz said. His name is Marcus. He's a nice guy. I... Marcus. Have you been seeing him long? She asked. Long enough? I want to start over, Mom. Take a few history courses. I just... I told the prosecutor to give Nancy a deal. I don't want to put all of us through a trial. Liz forced out. She deserves life for what she did to you. Her mother insisted, which confused Liz. She assumed that her mother would try to sweep Nancy's crimes under the rug. I wish you would just come back home, Liz. You know, Brett and I would make room for you. I don't like the idea of you marrying a stranger. Do you need money for the flight? No, Mom, trust me, I'll be fine. Essie is married to my future husband's brother. At least I know her, Liz reasoned. Oh, that's somewhat reassuring. But the two of you have got to visit. I need to meet them, she insisted. You will, someday. Liz said as Marcus entered the room. I have to go, Marcus is... Oh, I don't think so, young lady. <clears throat> you don't tell me that you nearly were killed and rushed me off the phone. Did you see that Marcus is there? Get him on the phone. Liz shot her fiancé a small smile. Marcus, my mother would like to speak to you. Liz announced. Sure. Marcus said, reaching for the phone. Hi, Mom. Marcus greeted with a grin. His own mother rolled her eyes. It is so nice to speak to you. My son, the charmer, she huffed. Marcus spent a couple of minutes talking to Liz's mother. He promised that he'd call her daily before hanging up the phone. I like your mom. She's nice, Marcus declared. Liz nodded. I thought she would be mad at me because Nancy was in jail. But she seems to be angry that I want my sister to take a deal, Liz explained. 
Your sister should pay for what she tried to do to you, Catherine said before getting to her feet. Now, go outside. You need to mingle with the guests. Before the ceremony, Liz was introduced to a few of the guests. She vaguely knew Tessa, who was one of Essie's former customers. At least that would be one more person that she could add to the friends list. The wedding was on the beach. Liz and Marcus sat in the back since they had been the last to be seated. It didn't take long for Esperanza to enter wearing a beautiful wedding dress. She seemed so happy. The romantic ceremony touched Liz. She was crying happy tears by the time Esperanza was kissing Asher. You love seeing your friends happy, Marcus realized. Of course I do. Essie is a great person. Asher looks like he loves her, she said as everyone got to their feet. Liz stood and applauded the couple. Since everyone was making a beeline for the food, Marcus directed Liz to the tent that the bride and groom had entered. Is that like a VIP tent for the bride and groom? Liz wondered. Now, Esperanza's Aunt Claudia was flown onto the island. My mother thought that they could have their reunion in private, Marcus explained, which made Liz grin. Can my mom come to Portham Island? Liz wanted to know. It depends on her, Marcus said before squeezing her hand. You seem happier. I was really worried that my mother wouldn't believe me. I guess now that she knows, I feel better, Liz said as Catherine exited the tent. Come in, she ordered. As soon as Marcus and Liz stepped into the tent, Liz felt embarrassed. She hadn't thought to buy her friend a gift. Can you lend me the money to buy them something? She softly asked Marcus. Don't worry. I signed the card, Mrs. and Mr. Lawson. You're covered. He assured Liz and told the bride that he had another surprise for her. Liz stepped forward, a grin on her face. She clutched Marcus's hand for dear life, worried that Essie would reject her. She was kind of angry when she left Jersey. No way! Esperanza squealed. I know. I just got here today. Marcus and I figured that we could hold off on our wedding until sunset, Liz said as she made eye contact with Essie. The bride seemed excited by the prospect. That was a good sign. Esperanza pulled Liz into her arms. Liz forced herself not to cry. Essie had been the sister that she wished for. Wow, I can't believe you took my advice, Esperanza said. Liz squeezed her friend. I am so happy for you, she told her future sister-in-law. I can't believe that you will be my sister-in-law, Esperanza said, winking at Marcus. So, you're going to get hitched at sunset, huh? Esperanza asked, a grin on her face. Well... Yeah, we don't know each other, and... Just get it over with after we eat. If you put it off, you might lose your nerve, Esperanza warned before snagging Asher from her aunt. Hey, man, I uh, sent for a mail-order bride, Marcus told Asher. This is Liz. She's Nancy's little sister, Esperanza told her husband. Esperanza frowned when Liz winced. Marcus reclaimed Liz's hand and squeezed. She would catch Esperanza up as soon as they had some bonding time. At sunset, Liz and Marcus stood on the back porch. All of the guests stayed to watch them get married. The reverend stood with them, excitement on his face. He seemed to love performing wedding ceremonies. Liz eyed Esperanza, who shot her a supportive look. Tessa was also there, her bright eyes filled with mischief. It was obvious that she couldn't wait to socialize with Liz. Liz, do you take Marcus as your lawfully wedded husband? Yes, Liz forced out. Do you promise to love, respect, honor? He listed a bunch of other things, but Liz suddenly became distracted. 
Marcus was brushing his thumb up and down the back of her hand. She sucked in a breath and could feel her face turning red. I do, Liz said as soon as the wedding officiant stopped speaking. I declare you husband and wife, you may kiss the bride, the reverend said with a lot of exuberance. Marcus gently cupped Liz's face between his hands and brushed his lips against hers. Her heart rate pounded as he deepened the kiss, his tongue entering her mouth. She was breathless when he pulled away. Wow. That kiss was... wow. Liz was having a hard time putting that kiss into words. Marcus took her hand and they walked over to his parents. Darren and Catherine took turns hugging her. Welcome to the family, Liz. I hope you know that you'll be hosting us for dinner tomorrow night, Catherine announced. Make something that doesn't come from a box. Before Liz could tell the woman no, she dragged Darren away. Essie approached her next. Congrats, Liz, she said before pulling her into a hug. You too, Essie, Liz responded. Tessa and her husband, Thomas, were next to greet her. Welcome to Port Island, Thomas formally said. May you have a long and prosperous career. He means congrats. He hopes you have a long and healthy marriage, Tessa corrected before rolling her eyes. No, I meant what I said, Tessa. No need to correct me. Uh, Mrs. Lawson. Good grief, call her Liz, everyone else does, Tessa hotly said. So, Thomas, are you interested in history at all? Liz wondered. No, he's more of a businessman, Tessa replied. I find some aspects of history fascinating, Thomas argued. It seemed that all the couple did was argue. Liz wished that she hadn't asked the man the question. Marcus chuckled. How about I take my bride home? He suggested, but it was like the couple didn't hear him. They went on arguing as Marcus and Liz walked home. Chapter 6 Liz stretched out in her comfortable king-sized bed. She couldn't believe how massive her new home was. For a girl that grew up in a two-bedroom apartment, it all felt kind of excessive. But she wasn't going to hold that against Marcus. After taking a long shower in her ensuite bathroom, she changed into a romper and sandals. She was determined to go for a walk. She had cash that she had earned from the diner. She figured that she could enjoy a nice hot cup of coffee and people watch. As soon as Liz strolled into the kitchen, she let out a surprised squeak. Marcus was sitting at the table eating a bowl of cereal. He seemed kind of tired. Marcus, you're still here? Liz asked, frowning at the clock on top of the stove. It was 10.30 a.m., Liz, it's Sunday, he reminded her, and she nodded. Right. I guess that means you wouldn't want to go to a coffee shop and people watch? Not that you would need to people watch. You're from here. I just wanted to get a feel for the Islanders. Like, do people talk a certain way? Who hangs out with whom? You know, that sort of thing, Liz excitedly listed. Marcus stood and walked over to Liz. He gently pressed a kiss to her lips. She was caught off guard. She reached for Marcus, looping her arms around his neck. He deepened the kiss, which made her toes curl. Her husband was sure a good kisser. As soon as he pulled back, she grinned. Good morning, baby. I would love to take you to a coffee shop, but I figured that we can go to the museum first. It isn't much, but you sure love history, he said. What do you love? Liz asked, curious. Movies, good cooking, horses, football, and kissing my wife. He responded in a husky tone before pressing another kiss to her lips. I see, 
Liz rasped out. Maybe I should also see what you have in your fridge. I am hosting your parents for dinner. Liz really wasn't interested in cooking for a sophisticated lady. She came from a world of hot dishes, shake and bake, and hamburger helpers. She'd either have to pick up a cookbook or hope that the woman didn't laugh at her outright. There isn't a grocery store on the island. We order everything online, her husband reported, which was ridiculous. What happens if a woman needs feminine products? What if a girl has a yeast infection or... Marcus held up a hand, seeming to be desperate for Liz to end her tirade. It wasn't until he pretended to gag that she realized that she brought up yeast infections with her husband while he was eating breakfast. Way to go, Liz. You are one big moron. Uh, well, if you must know, the, uh, cycles of women aren't regular. Uh, that's why women have a hard time conceiving. Well, uh, that's what I've been told, Marcus said. I don't know why. Uh, why don't you ask Essie? Hold the phone. How often will my cycle be? Liz asked, aghast. Oh, well, um, can you ask my mother? Marcus desperately asked. I guess I could, but I don't know her well, and we're going to have sex someday. I... Have you decided when that will be? Marcus teased, which made Liz roll her eyes. I don't have an exact date, but I do need to get to know you better. So please just give me the information. I'm curious. Liz pleaded. Two times a year? He responded, which made Liz blink. What the hell? Are you serious? Liz squeaked. How the hell can we have children if I'm only going to ovulate twice a year? Marcus shrugged. Don't worry about it, Liz. We haven't even made it to second base yet. Marcus said, which made her mind travel to places that made her shiver with anticipation. Marcus smirked. Oh, look, my wife is blushing. Marcus's teasing made her face feel like it was on fire. This man was impossible. Liz already knew that. It was like he loved to embarrass her. Then again, she did plenty of that on her own, talking about yeast infections at the breakfast table. Speaking of breakfast, she poured milk and cereal into a bowl and joined Marcus at the table. After breakfast, she looked in the freezer and noticed ground beef, tater tots, and frozen green beans. Her heart filled with excitement. It looked like she had the ingredients for a hot dish. She wasn't sure if people who ate filet mignon ate hot dishes, but that was all she knew how to make? She sighed and took out the ground beef, figuring that it could defrost in the sink. Then she followed her husband out into the bright sunshine. Liz forgot all about her worries about hosting her in-laws for dinner when she walked into the museum. As soon as the calming ambiance wrapped around her, Liz closed her eyes and took a deep breath. The smell of knowledge filled the air. She was ecstatic to be in this place. Liz, are you all right? Marcus asked, puzzled. I am, I just... I love museums. Marcus laughed as he ushered her to the first exhibit. Liz's eyes grew wide at the mural. It was of a Native American chief of a Cherokee tribe, standing on a Portham Island beach, with confusion in his eyes. So, Cherokee Native Americans ended up on Portham Island? Liz asked. How did you know that he was a Cherokee native? A haughty female voice asked. Liz turned and faced the brunette, who had tan skin and serious dark eyes. Well, you can tell by how he's dressed. Just look at the white feathers, the belt, and the tassels. I suspect that he was an important figure in his tribe. How cool! Liz squeaked. Did you know that the Cherokee... The woman shook her head. Of course I know about the history. That man in the painting was my grandfather... He appeared on this island out of nowhere and couldn't figure a way out. 
His people called him a traitor for falling in love with my grandmother, a Puritan. That is insane. The Puritans of New England were... Miss Lawson, is that right? The woman haughtily asked. Yes, Liz said in a questioning tone. She had the sense that this woman didn't like her at all. I probably know more about the history than you do since my family lived it. So spare me. I swear you young people think you know everything because of your internet and smartphones. I just can't. Why come here then? Liz snapped. So that you can disrespect anyone who has an interest in history? I was awed by this work of art. That's all. No need to be an entitled snob. Marcus stepped forward before the mean lady could say another word. Mary, I think that we're going to move to another exhibit, Marcus quickly said. Now I understand why you're in a museum as opposed to being in bed, Mary said with a huff. Liz was about to tell the woman that it was none of her business what her and her husband did. But Marcus took her to an exhibit about gladiators that had ended up on the island. By the time they finished touring the museum, Liz had worked up an appetite. Should we go out to lunch? If not, I can make us hot dogs, Liz offered. Marcus smiled at the prospect. Hot dogs sound appealing, he admitted as they exited the museum. Liz couldn't help but think that the museum wasn't crowded enough. She'd have to convince a few of her friends to visit. When they arrived home, something occurred to Liz. She stared up at her husband with a hopeful expression on her face. Do you have a horse? She asked with interest. Marcus shook his head. I almost have enough to buy horses, he said. How many are you getting? Liz asked, curious. Fifty horses. I want to give the orphanage with horses before I buy horses for myself. Those children deserve to ride horses. So her husband was the charitable sort. Will you take me to the orphanage someday? I'd like to adopt a baby, Liz casually said, which made Marcus nod. I was hoping you'd say that. I'll make an appointment for next month so that we'll have some time to know one another, Marcus said. Liz was filled with so much excitement that she kissed him on the lips. Then they entered the house that Liz swore would be crawling with babies someday. She boiled hot dogs and served them with chips and an apple. After eating the simple lunch, Marcus went to his office to work while Liz began preparing that night's dinner. Hopefully, her in-laws would enjoy what she served. After running into Mary, Liz had no energy for entitled people. Chapter 7 Dear Marcus, after your wife's display of disrespect, I have decided to go with the services of another processing center. She is unkind and rather disrespectful. I do not want my grandchildren thinking that it's okay for someone to speak to their elders that way. I will make sure to forward this email to all of my friends and family. Mary Blackhawk Marcus rubbed his forehead after reading that stiff email. Liz had chosen to tangle with Mary Blackhawk, which wasn't the smartest of decisions. But he couldn't help but admire the fact that his wife had a backbone. She was strong and didn't let much get her down. For goodness sake, a couple days ago, she had been trying to survive against an intruder. And now she was in their kitchen, cooking a meal for his parents. Yes, not having the Black Hawks as customers would hurt business, but he had a lot of customers on the island who wouldn't boycott his processing center because of an insult to a stuck-up, entitled woman. Marcus still remembered what his mother had said about her. Mary Black Hawk thinks that she's the most important member of our community— in fact, she forced her husband to take her family's last name, since her history was more superior. The ringing of the doorbell coaxed Marcus to leave his office. He strolled over to the front door and pulled it open. 
He blinked in surprise when Emma Adams stood on the other side, her baby in her arms. Her tear-streaked face made Marcus think that things with Emma were about to get complicated. I can't do this, Emma declared. I can't be a mother. I don't have it in me. Marcus briefly wondered why Emma thought that an embarrassing secret made her his problem. He hadn't dated her, and they weren't friends. But he instinctively took the baby boy when she thrusted him at Marcus. Marcus peered down into the trusting blue eyes of a precious child. He seems happy. Why do you... Tell Brad I'm staying with my mother. I refuse to be a mother. It isn't what I want, Emma said before leaving the house. What the hell was Marcus going to do with a baby? He turned to find a gaping Liz standing behind him. Is that an ex-girlfriend? Liz demanded. No, that was Asher's ex fiance What are we supposed to do with this little guy? Marcus asked his befuddled wife. Do you have the baby's father's phone number? Liz asked before taking the child from him. No, Brad and I aren't friends, but uh, I'm sure that my brother will have a contact for him. Marcus figured. Before he could bother with getting his phone, the doorbell rang again. Marcus opened the door and was relieved to see that it was his parents. Who did you think would be at the door, Marcus? His mother demanded as the baby began crying. Who's the baby? Emma decided that she didn't want to be a mother, Marcus awkwardly said. Let me call Diana. She'll straighten this out, his mother insisted, as she made her way to the baby. She took the distressed infant from Liz and rushed into the living room. It took no time for the child to stop crying. Well, what an eventful day, Liz commented as she directed Darren to sit at the kitchen table. Marcus had no idea why Liz didn't just host his parents in the dining room, but he wasn't about to correct his wife. After witnessing the talking to that she'd given Mary Blackhawk, Marcus was convinced that his sexy bride had quite the temper. He briefly wondered if the passion that she had for history could translate to the bedroom. He shook that thought from his mind, knowing that Liz would come to him eventually. He'd just have to woo her to his bed. After sitting down beside his father, Liz poured glasses of lemonade for the pair. Marcus took a sip of the drink and puckered his mouth. Wow, it was a bit sour. His mother strolled into the room, a cell phone pressed to her ear. Diana, your crazy daughter-in-law dropped your grandson off at Marcus's house and declared that she wasn't going to be a mother anymore. She didn't leave any diapers or bottles for her son. Come as quick as you can. As soon as his mother hung up, she plopped down at one of the chairs. Liz pulled some type of casserole out of the oven along with rolls. She pulled a salad out of the fridge along with dressing. Catherine frowned at the casserole as if trying to identify it. What is that? She asked. It's tater tot hot dish, Liz announced. I didn't have a chance to go shopping since our dinner plans were made last minute, Liz said as she began scooping food onto plates. Tater tot hot dish. I've never heard of such a thing, his mother said, arching a brow. I like it, Liz insisted before blushing. Thanks for cooking, Marcus said. At least it's not frozen pizza? His mom was being rather difficult and he didn't like it. Before Liz could sit and eat, the baby began crying. Liz ran from the room and appeared moments later with the baby in her arms. We don't have baby formula for this little guy. I think he's hungry, she said, concerned. Marcus was out of his depth. It wasn't like he could go to a corner store and grab baby food. But then his wife's eyes lit up. What about the orphanage? They have baby bottles and baby formula. We can go there and ask to borrow equipment. Catherine, when did Diana say that she was coming? In three hours. 
She has a banquet to attend, too, Catherine hotly said before taking a bite of her food. I can put the food in Tupperware containers and we can eat at the orphanage. Actually, we can give them the rest of the food. I ended up making two casseroles. I like to meal prep, but I wouldn't mind giving them the food. I could... What a great idea, Catherine interrupted. Marcus, why don't you give Jill a call? Marcus went into his office and followed his mother's advice. Jill picked up on the second ring. Hey, Marcus, how can I help you? The young woman asked. Do you have supplies for a newborn? Emma dropped the baby off and said that she didn't want to be a mom anymore. She didn't give us food or diapers, he reported. Come by. I'll be able to assist you, she said, her tone soft. Thanks, Jill. <laughs> we will be there, Marcus said. As soon as Marcus hung up, he retrieved the cart he used for groceries and dragged it into the kitchen. Liz packed the Tupperware containers along with the rest of the food she made into the cart. No one said a word as Marcus pushed the cart out into the night. The orphanage was five blocks away. His father, Darren, was nice enough to hold the baby for the trek. When the building came into view, Marcus was surprised to see that a horse was tied to one of the hitching posts. Jill, the woman that ran the orphanage, didn't have any horses. He entered the building just in time to witness a spectacle. The building looked more like a hotel. There was a lobby that held a waiting area and a receptionist desk. Jill sat behind the desk, her eyes annoyed. A woman with green hair was in her face. I'm returning him. He is a menace. I can't believe you sent someone like that, she screamed. A boy who had to be seven was quietly sitting in one of the chairs, looking through a picture book. Liz sat beside him and gently touched his shoulder. Mrs. Moore, this is the fifth child that you've returned. If you can't work things out with Finn, you will not be able to adopt anymore, Jill warned. Maybe if you gave me a child that was well-behaved, then none of this would happen. I told the council that you weren't fit to take over for your mother. You are a no-good piece of trash. Why don't you step aside and let someone... That's enough, Liz said as she rushed to Jill. You can't talk to me that way, the angry woman shouted. Oh, and you can tell this woman that she was a piece of trash because you can't discipline a kid? I asked Finn why he dyed your hair green. He told me it was because you told him that he wasn't allowed to play outside at all. He said that he worked all day and didn't have time to play. And you dared withhold a meal from him. You aren't fit to be a mother. If you want a servant, why don't you hire one? Liz yelled. Marcus felt embarrassed that he hadn't thought to go to Jill's defense. But his wife, who was a stranger thought to defend the overworked Jill? The woman didn't dignify Liz's accusations with a response. She held her head up high and left the orphanage. Jill let out a breath. Finn, go check with your floor leader, she ordered. The kid happily ran up the stairs and vanished. Thanks for that. At least she won't come back. Chapter 8 It took half an hour for the baby to be fed and changed. Jill, the woman who ran the orphanage, was grateful for the extra food. They dined in the cafeteria with some of the older kids. Jill sat at their table, her eyes filled with exhaustion. So, Jill, how long have you been running this orphanage? Liz wanted to know. Jill's face briefly clouded with grief. Then she forced a calm expression on her face. My parents died in a boating accident some years back. My brothers Kendrick, Sal, and I decided to keep my parents' dream alive. But Kendrick's married now, so he can't dedicate as much time. His wife Julia does volunteer quite a bit when she isn't working. I... I will help in any way I can, Liz volunteered. Name the chore and I'll do it. I'm also helping out at Cassandra's mail-order bride business, and hopefully I can take a few history classes. You've got a good operation here, Liz complimented. 
Sure, I will take all the help I can get, especially in a kitchen. Jenna, the girl who volunteers, is pregnant, and her doctor wants her to take it easy, Jill said. Then I will help you. My cooking isn't great, but I can follow a recipe. Maybe I could talk to Essie. She'll love to help, Liz said with certainty. Essie is starting a spa, Catherine reminded Liz. But Liz was not deterred. Don't you worry, Jill. I will find volunteers. Liz was going to make it her personal mission. Jill looked as though she was about to collapse from exhaustion. She was sure that a few of the women could help with some of the minor tasks. Just make a list of the allergies and I'll get started. Liz decided. Allergies? Jill asked as if the concept was confusing. Dear, no one on the island has any allergies. The mist keeps us relatively healthy. Catherine reminded her. Right, that whole period thing. How in the hell did she forget that fact? What time does breakfast start? Liz wanted to know. Jill smiled. Breakfast starts at 7 a.m. It used to start at 8.15, but then the council ordered the orphans to attend the island schools, which is great, since that frees up some of my time. Is 7 too early? Jill wondered. Hell yes, but Liz would make it work. It's not a problem. Why did the council have to order the orphans to attend public schools? Are the schools not good? Liz wondered. The schools are wonderful. It's just that some of the influential women didn't like the orphans going to school with their children. So every time an orphan would enroll, they would complain. No one has come by so far. But I think it's because of the council. No one goes against them. Jill explained. A pleading look from Marcus told Liz to drop the subject. Thankfully, Jill agreed to babysit Emma's son. Liz was relieved since she didn't want that troublesome woman anywhere near Marcus. She sensed that there was a past between her husband and Asher's ex. Though what kind of past it was, Liz had no clue. But she wasn't going to question Marcus about it until he trusted her. So instead of bombarding everyone with questions about Emma, she enjoyed the rest of her meal with her new family and her newest friend and happily walked home with her husband when the night ended. An hour later, Liz heard a knock on her bedroom door. She opened the door and saw Marcus standing shirtless in the doorway. Wow, he was... Her mind blanked out for a moment before she forced herself to speak. Oh, wow, um, you... Damn it, Liz, say something cute. I just wanted to give my wife a goodnight kiss, Marcus said, his eyes dark with desire. Okay, Liz said uncertainly. She walked forward, her heart beating double time. Marcus grinned before pulling her into his arms. Her hands caressed his bare back before his lips descended on hers. The kiss was slow and sensual. He leisurely invaded her mouth with his tongue, exploring every part. All Liz could do was hold on as Marcus's hand slipped under her pajama shirt to caress her lower back. He glanced away, her body feeling cold as he eased towards the exit. Liz wanted to tell him to stay and kiss him some more, but he smirked before spinning on his heels and leaving her alone. Liz was in her apartment, her heart racing. A man in a mask was pointing a gun at her. Nancy was on the couch, her fingertip caressing the blade of a knife. Nancy, aren't you going to help me? Liz asked as she eyed the man. The first shot! The silent masked intruder fired, slammed into the wall beside Liz. Good. He missed. All she had to do was make it toward the door. Liz ran for the exit, which was three feet away. She heard another shot fire, but the bullet didn't hit her. With her heart pumping, she wrapped her hand around the doorknob and felt something pierce her back. Liz let out a scream as her knees gave out. She felt the blood covering her back. She needed to get up. She had to escape. She had to... Baby, it's okay. 
a warm voice said. Wake up. Nancy can't uh, hurt you anymore. Liz vaguely felt fingertips brush her forehead. And then her eyes flew open. She blinked twice before realizing just the lamp was on. Marcus was in bed with her, his face close to hers. She peered into his concerned eyes and let out a breath. It was a dream, she hoarsely said. Yes, baby, it was only a nightmare. Nancy can't get you here. You're safe. Marcus gently said before pulling her into his arms. Her face rested against his chest, which was nice. His heartbeat was steady, which was a comfort. He began stroking her back, which made the fear leave her body. Sorry for waking you up, Liz softly said after raising her head. It's okay. You needed me and I'm here, Marcus told her. His words were warm and filled her with comfort. Sleep, Liz. I'm here. Just sleep. It took a while, but she fell asleep, Marcus's presence chasing away her nightmares. The next morning, Liz discovered herself splayed on top of her husband. She squeaked and rolled off of him, which made him laugh. She sat up and eyed the clock. It was half past five, which meant that she had just enough time to shower before heading to the orphanage. Sighing, she rushed out of bed. What? No good morning kiss? Marcus complained as she rushed into the bathroom. I'm going to be late, Liz shouted as she stripped out of her pajamas, took a three-minute shower, and brushed her teeth. Then she placed her wet, dark hair into a ponytail and walked out of the bathroom in a towel. Marcus was still stretched out on her bed, his eyes closed. Liz let out a startled yelp that made his dark eyes open. What? Marcus asked. You're in here and I'm in a towel. I just... Close your eyes. I don't want to make you leave. I just... I need to get dressed. Well, I need to put lotion and deodorant on before getting dressed. Crap. Marcus laughed, which made Liz forget about her concerns. Relax, Liz. I'll close my eyes this time, but next time, I'm going to watch the show. He warned, a smirk playing on his lips. Of course, she blushed at his words. Her only experience was with her ex-boyfriend, whom she had known for a year. She had just met the guy, for goodness sake. But something about Marcus made her wish that she wasn't so shy. He was sweet, kind, and had a special charm about him. But one thing her mother had taught her was to never do anything that she wasn't comfortable with. Liz had hundreds of years to get to know Marcus. They didn't have to rush into anything. Liz dressed in a blue short sleeve shirt and a matching pair of shorts. She put on her running shoes and, on a whim, kissed Marcus on the shoulder before running downstairs. Liz quickly exited the house, nearly running over her smiling sister-in-law. Oh, she had probably wanted to come for a visit. Esperanza was wearing a sundress, her dark hair up in a bun. Wanna come? I'm volunteering at the orphanage, Liz said. A spark of excitement flashed in Esperanza's eyes. Sure, she said. The women barely made it 15 feet down the sidewalk when Tessa rushed out of a Victorian home. Her desperate expression made Liz pause. Is everything all right? Liz asked her. Thomas thought that it would be great for me to help Mrs. Clarence with her garden since she's getting old. I came by super early in hopes that she wasn't awake. Please tell me that you guys are heading to do something noble, Tessa pleaded. Then I won't feel so guilty when I join you. We're helping out at the orphanage, Liz said. Fine by me, Tessa said. So, ladies, Jill runs the place, Liz began before telling her two friends what had happened. Now Emma is bothering you guys, Essie asked in disbelief. You should have seen her, Liz insisted. She just barged in and expected us to take care of her baby, Liz said. 
right before tugging open one of the double doors to the orphanage. She stepped in, followed by her friends, and saw a smiling Jill in the lobby waiting for them. Welcome, ladies. Uh, I haven't woken the kids up yet. We have a lot of work to do, Jill quickly said, and the women followed her through the dining room into the kitchen. Chapter 9 Oh my goodness, what a beautiful kitchen. Look at the workspace. Liz gushed as she eyed the work tables. Esperanza took a deep breath. Where's the cook? She wondered. She quit, Jill reluctantly admitted. Liz volunteered to help us for the day. Jill's exhausted expression caused Liz's heart to squeeze. She was absolutely disgusted by the islanders who turned a blind eye to the orphanage. Let's get started then, Essie said. Tessa sighed. I don't cook. Uh, is there any cleaning that needs to get done? She hopefully asked. Oh, uh, the laundry for the younger kids needs to get done, Jill excitedly said. Lead the way, Tessa said before following Jill out of the room. Essie pulled one of the refrigerators open and retrieved two gallons of milk. I think we should do a continental breakfast. Can you make muffins? Esperanza wanted to know. Liz nodded as an idea popped into her head. I have a better idea. Why don't you work on the muffins while I make egg bake? Liz said. What is egg bake? Esperanza asked her puzzled expression making Liz chuckle. It takes a day to make. Jill can serve it for breakfast tomorrow. Liz got to work preparing four casserole dishes full of egg bake, wrapped the dishes in saran wrap, and placed them in the fridge to sit for the next day. Then she helped Essie set the buffet table. They placed a couple of containers of cereal onto the table along with the fruit salad, freshly baked muffins, and donut hulls. Then Liz wheeled a mini fridge that was well stocked with milk into the dining room. Liz had just finished plugging in the fridge when orphans began filling in. Liz eyed the children, trying to determine which kid she could possibly take home. Her husband had said that she could adopt one, right? The first child, a beautiful girl who appeared to be 13, ushered two small children to the buffet table. Good morning, Liz greeted. I'm Liz. I'm helping out until a new chef can be hired. This is my sister-in-law, Esperanza. The girl nodded and gave the women a soft smile. I remember you from yesterday. You brought that extra casserole? I'm Kylie, and these are Mike and Tristan, she said, introducing Liz to two children, who couldn't be more than five. Hi, guys. Mike, Tristan, would you both like some cereal? Liz wanted to know. Both children smiled up at her. Muffin? Mike said, his blue eyes lighting up with excitement. Essie grabbed a plate and placed a muffin on it. Tristan requested cereal, so Liz filled a bowl for him, and the two women led the kids to a table. Kylie brought them orange juice before snatching up two more children who had been waiting outside. Two teenagers entered, each of them escorting three children. Since these boys were a bit older than Kylie, Liz allowed them to feed the kids. She walked over to Esperanza, her heart in her throat. I can't believe Jill and her brothers run this place by herself she told her friend who had just refilled the tray of muffins. Jill and her siblings run a tight ship, Essie complimented as Tessa rushed into the room. She made a beeline for Liz and Essie, a satisfied expression on her face. Good news, Tessa announced. Kevin says that we got the site for our spa approved. The architect is working on some plans. That's awesome, Liz said while Essie seemed preoccupied by something else. Hello, Esperanza. Why is Liz more excited about the spa than you are? Tessa hotly challenged. I am excited. I just, I don't know. I don't want to get my hopes up. I think I'll be thrilled once I can see the building. Tessa nodded. I love proving Thomas wrong. It's like I live for it, she said. So you don't actually want to have a spa? Liz asked as Jill approached them. The woman who ran the orphanage began counting under her breath. Then she nodded. Good, we aren't missing anyone, she said as she eyed the buffet table. Freshly baked muffins? Yep, 
I figured that anyone who didn't want cereal could have one. Liz figured. Ladies, would you like to assist me with making school lunches? Esperanza, Tessie, and Liz nodded. Miss Hall, can I speak to you? Mrs. Blackhawk asked. Cassandra closed the lid to her laptop and focused on the stuffy woman that she had just buzzed into her office. The woman hung in the same social circles as her parents. What a small office. The council obviously didn't think that your business would benefit Portum Island, she said. Cassandra stiffened, wondering why this woman was in her office. Mrs. Blackhawk, I recall that Mitch is married. What brings you here? She inquired. As if Mitch needs to send for a mail-order bride. <laughs> Half the women on this island are in love with him, she bragged. Right, I understand. Is there anything I can do for you? Before the cranky woman could respond, Lance rushed into their office, clutching three coffees. Hey, boss, I know that I'm late, but I've come bearing gifts, he said before pausing. Mrs. Blackhawk, are you here to match one of your nephews? Lance wanted to know. No, I'm here to talk to the both of you about the brides you are choosing. First, you send us Esperanza, who isn't so bad, but she did yell at Emma Adams in the middle of an ice cream shop. Emma was being annoying, Lance defended. She tried to interfere in Esperanza's marriage. Then, you match the foul-mouthed Tessa with Thomas. That family is embarrassed by her conduct. Then you sent that Julia, the mouse who likes to eat... I don't know much about her, but quite frankly, I'm not impressed. And now you brought us Liz. Liz, really? You match the likes of her to a lucrative businessman, Mrs. Blackhawk demanded. Cassandra had the feeling that the woman was angry that the four women who had come to Portum Island, thus far, weren't the caddy sort. She would have said so, but Lance spoke first. From what I heard, everyone who has been matched are in happy marriages. <laughs> Isn't that the most important thing? He challenged, which made Cassandra grin. Lance is speaking the truth. In fact, some relatives of the matched men have approached me. Now, Mrs. Blackhawk, when did these women offend you, exactly? Cassandra wondered. I had no idea why I thought I could talk to you, Mrs. Blackhawk huffed. You are a disappointment to your family. The woman shot Cassandra a disgusted look before making her exit. Her harsh words wounded Cassandra in such a way that she didn't think that she could breathe. Lance approached her desk, his concerned gaze causing warmth to fill her chest. She was so glad that she had Lance. He was her other half, her anchor. His blue eyes bore into her dark eyes. You're not a failure he said. Don't listen to that woman. She's just upset because Liz probably said something to her. I'm not sure what Mrs. Blackhawk was trying to accomplish, but focus on your work. Who is the next person that we need to match? Not sure if anyone is a good match for Vince. All of the women I've received kits from seemed a bit high-strung. Cassandra figured, maybe we should hold off on matching him. I think that the council should give us a chance to make this a fully active business. You've done well. I mean, Esperanza's pregnant, he noted. True, but I don't want to push it, Cassandra confessed. Now that Mrs. Blackhawk is involved, things have gotten more complicated. Before Cassandra could tell Lance that they would have to move down the list, the bell rang. Cassandra was relieved when Asher Lawson was her next visitor. He had a piece of paper in his grip. Oh, great, she would have more people to match. Some of the women weren't good candidates since the barrier rejected their spit. But most of the women made for viable matches. All she needed was more men to match them with. Chapter 10 Marcus blinked in surprise when Brad Adams strolled into the processing center. Brad's family didn't typically pick up the wares that they ordered online. They sent their servants to do such a lowly task. Brad was a penny pincher. Maybe he fired Mrs. Burns? Unfortunately for Marcus, his line was relatively empty. 
It was positively odd, really. All day, people would only bother with his line if the others were full. It made for a slow, arduous process. Brad? Marcus said, his fingers beginning to type the man's name into his computer. Marcus, just the man I wanted to see. Are you aware that Mary Blackhawk's friends are shunning you until you properly teach your wife manners? He asked, his amused expression making Marcus stiffen. Say, you couldn't find a lovely Port of Islander woman to marry. Look, Brad, is there a point to your visit? Marcus asked impatiently. He didn't think that anything was wrong with Liz. His woman was passionate, kind, and didn't take anyone's crap. I'm just here to thank you, Brad said, his expression turning serious. Emma's having difficulties with being a mom. You understand, right? It happens with some women. I think I actually have to hire a nanny, he said. His defeated attitude made Marcus feel bad for the man. He didn't know his Liz well, but knew that she would make a loving mother. She wouldn't have pawned her baby off on someone else. Hell, she was the one volunteering at an orphanage. Before he could tell Brad that, the man spun on his heel and stormed off. Marcus rubbed his eyes and smiled at the next customer who walked into the processing center. Angela Vaughn was a tall woman with dark brown hair and olive skin. Her dark eyes traveled to one of the other lines, which was nearly out the door. Angela, you won't go into this line? Marcus asked. The woman blushed before slowly shuffling her way to the counter. She eyed Marcus as if he were a bug she was being forced to squash. Marcus, your wife is wreaking havoc in Portum Island, she declared. Excuse me? Marcus asked, surprised. She's only been here two days. What could she have possibly done? She prevented my sister from adopting a baby. She stole Emma's baby and gave him to Jill. She... It wasn't theft. Emma handed her baby to me. To babysit for a while. She didn't expect for your wife to put her precious child into an orphanage. Imagine what kind of disease that poor baby could have gotten from those rancid children. She spat. Marcus scowled at the ignorant woman. But she didn't take the hint and kept on talking. You know, my sister was just trying to tame one of those fiends, she complained. Angela, would you like your order? Marcus asked, hopefully. Angela rolled her eyes. For today, I'll have to pass. No one will talk to you until you manage your wife. Liz Lawson rushed into the house that she shared with her husband. She whistled when she entered the kitchen. The place was spotless, the scent of product cleaner lingering in the air. Marcus was at the kitchen table typing furiously on his laptop. Liz smiled before quickly washing her hands. She walked over to her preoccupied husband and quickly kissed the top of his head. He glanced up at her and rubbed his eyes. Oh, hey, Liz, how long have you been standing there? Marcus asked as he made eye contact with her. His tired eyes sent a bolt of concern through her. It looked like a bone-deep mental exhaustion. You look stressed out, Liz noted. Why? Some petty islanders are shunning me until I handle you, he reported. Hurt and confusion filled Liz's heart. That's extreme. What did I do? Liz asked, unable to hide her WTF expression. You told us Cecilia Vaughn and Mary Blackhawk. Those two women are two of the most influential people on Portham Island. By influential, you mean rich, Liz asked. Of course, yet another privileged person thought that they were better than everyone. Yes. Since I agree with you, I'm going to let this pass, her husband decided. But the indignant feeling inside Liz knew that she wasn't going to ignore the situation. Whatever makes you happy, she said. But in her mind, Liz was thinking, it's war. She pressed another kiss to his forehead before glancing in the fridge. I'm thinking of making grilled ham and cheese sandwiches for dinner. What do you think? Liz wanted to know. 
Sounds good, he absentmindedly responded. Liz pulled the ingredients that she needed and got to work. She made a salad to go with the sandwiches. She also cut up apples that she covered with cinnamon and brown sugar before baking them. After her easy meal was made, Marcus thankfully put away his laptop before joining her. I noticed that you cleaned, Liz noted. Marcus shook his head. I hired a maid to clean our house three times a week, he explained. Well, there went the theory of Marcus being a stress cleaner, Liz thought to herself. Liz happily bit into her sandwich, the taste making her eyes light up. Marcus seemed more excited about the prospect of eating the baked apples, which made Liz grin. So you are interested in eating your dessert before dinner, she teased. Mm, since I can't get what I really want, I should be allowed to have dessert first. His suggestive smile made Liz's belly flip. He really was a handsome man. Well, um, I, um... Let's play 20 questions, Liz blurted out. I'd like to know more about you so I can... Wow, Liz, it's nice to finally see you uncomfortable. <laughs> Does the topic of lovemaking make you nervous? He teased. She glanced down at the remains of her sandwich and considered what to tell him. Is that your first question? She asked, curious. Yes, Marcus replied. Liz sighed. I've always been the smart poor girl that guys never wanted to talk to. I wasn't cool enough. Well, unless someone was trying to win a bet. I tried dating a history buff once. Our argument about Hannibal's military prowess was so bad that... Wait a second, who's Hannibal? Marcus wanted to know. Hannibal was a general from Carthage. He traveled through the Alps with men and battled Rome, then... <sighs> Liz shook her head. No, keep going, Marcus encouraged. I like it when you tell your historical stories. Her heart warmed at the thought. Well, he pretty much battled the Romans. Carthage was stupid. They refused to back Hannibal once he got the upper hand. Jonah, the guy I dated, thought that Carthage made a good move for the position that they were in. I said Hannibal was at fault. If he wanted a victory, he should have conquered Rome. Nope. He fell for the ultimate trap. What was that? Marcus asked. The Romans attacked Carthage, and he actually brought his troops back to defend Carthage, even though Carthage had abandoned him, she said. What are you doing tomorrow? Marcus wondered. I'm going to stop by Cassandra's office. I also promised to help Esperanza sometime this week, Liz noted. Do you want to go to the beach tomorrow? He asked. Sure, I love to swim. I also like collecting seashells. I left my collection back in North Dakota. I'd like to start a new one, Liz insisted. Marcus stood, eyes sparkling with mischief. Want to watch a movie? He asked. Liz didn't understand why her husband was so excited about watching a movie, but she figured that she could go along with it. After Marcus did the dishes, they sat in the living room the plush couch making her sigh in happiness. Marcus handed her the remote and grinned. What do you want to watch? He asked, curious. I'll watch anything as long as it's not a reality show. Nancy used to make me watch those all the time. Liz complained. Marcus nodded and flipped the channels. He ended up settling on a documentary that covered crime lords. Liz frowned when Marcus patted his lap. Sit, he ordered, a sparkle in his eye. Liz followed his directions and his arms wrapped around her. Moments later, his lips were on hers. These kisses were slow and exploratory. Marcus's tongue leisurely slid into her mouth, his strokes lighting her on fire. She kissed him back her fingers tangled in his dark brown hair. Her husband was polite with his hands. He didn't push her into something that she didn't want. They simply passed the time cuddling and making out. 
As she was in Marcus's arms, Liz felt safe and cherished. She could see herself falling for this man. There was something about him that made her want to be close to him. She relished the time that they spent together. Liz was almost disappointed when she forced herself back to her room. Liz stormed into the apartment that she shared with her sister. All she desired was a hot bath. Nancy was on the couch with a man who was wearing thick glasses. Hey, Nancy, Liz greeted. Nancy smiled. Hey, sis, can you do something for me? Nancy asked. What do you want me to do? Liz wanted to know. Stand still, Nancy said, before her friend pointed a gun at Liz and fired. Chapter 11 Marcus heard the ear-splitting scream and bolted upright. He got out of bed, his feet slamming against the hardwood. His heart raced as he dashed out of his bedroom and ran to Liz's. She was thrashing around in her bed, her hands clutching the blankets. Marcus quickly slipped into bed beside her. He gently shook her shoulders. It took a few shakes, but her beautiful blue eyes opened and they connected with his. Her anguish nearly gutted him. Marcus pulled his wife into his arms, her head resting on his chest. His hands rubbed her back as she trembled. Marcus, don't leave me. She begged. I won't leave you, he told the frightened woman. I promise. After he said those words, he felt Liz relax against him. They laid like that in silence until she fell asleep. Marcus strolled down the stairs, the smell of bacon tickling his nose. Liz had decided to cook. His excitement caused his steps to pick up. He spotted her in the kitchen making plates of pancakes and bacon. As soon as she had both plates on the table, he rushed over to her and cupped her face. Thank you for making something that smells so good, he told her before gently kissing her plump lips. She returned the kiss with such enthusiasm that he found himself gripping her hips as her eager tongue entered his mouth. Her hands wrapped around his neck as their kiss grew more passionate. He knew that he had to break away from Liz. She was vulnerable. Marcus was considering having Liz see one of the therapists in town. But when her fingernails scraped the back of his head, he was lost to the sensations. On instinct, he lifted Liz onto the counter, her legs wrapping around his waist. His veins burned with passion as she rolled her hips against his. He briefly pulled from the kiss to peer into her hooded eyes. You okay? Marcus wanted to know. Liz thankfully nodded. Are you going to be late for work? Liz huskily asked. He shook his head. They can survive without me for a while. A bright smile stretched across her face. Then you can help me at the orphanage, Liz excitedly said. Essie and Tessa can't come. They have something to do for the spa, so my nice husband can come along. Then you can take me to the processing center. Then we can go visit Cassandra to see if she needs any help. Then, then I'll take you home and have my way with you, Marcus said, his eyes boring into hers. Liz blushed as she nodded. Okay, uh, let's eat breakfast first, she replied. Marcus kissed her on the forehead before sitting at the table. He didn't mind helping at the orphanage. Those kids were great. But he wasn't sure about taking Liz to the processing center. What was that going to do for her self-esteem? He wanted his wife to love Port Island since it would be her home for the rest of her life. Liz whistled as she walked down the sidewalk holding hands with her husband. She deliberately waved at people who were riding their horses or bicycles. She didn't allow the heat to get to her, damn it. Those nightmares were in her past. She was going to call the district attorney and ensure that her evil sister took a plea. Once it was certain that Nancy was put away, everything would be okay. 
Her sweet, supportive, and passionate man gave her butterflies. She wasn't going to let her past interfere with her new, happy life on Portham Island. Yes, there were mean girls who couldn't stand her, but who cared? All her life, people had looked down on the girl too poor to go to prom. But her life was different now. She smiled as Jill welcomed them into the orphanage. The woman looked a little better than the day before, which was comforting. She escorted them to the kitchen, which smelled heavily of coffee. She eyed the coffee pot with surprise. You bought a coffee pot? Liz asked, surprised. Jill shook her head. I found it in the attic and decided to plug it in. I definitely need caffeine to deal with these kids, Jill said. Marcus, it's nice to see you. I see your wife convinced you to volunteer. Sure did. She was very persuasive, he said, a smirk causing Liz's face to heat up. This man was always saying something that made her face turn red. Jill smirked. I'm glad to hear it. I'm excited to try the egg bake. Jill rushed out of the kitchen, leaving the couple alone. So, uh, I should probably warn you about the Lawson curse, Marcus said. The Lawson curse? Liz asked as she pulled the two casseroles of egg bake from the fridge. She carried her bird into the counter and laid it on top of the clean surface. Yeah, you wouldn't want me to get near the stove, he said. Right, Essie told me I'd rather not test fate, she teased as she preheated the oven. That's why you will help me set up the cereal bar. Sounds good, Marcus excitedly said as he wrapped his arms around her from behind, the heat of his stomach scorching her back through her clothes. For a moment, she stood there and savored his closeness. Then the oven beeped, announcing that it had finished preheating. She regretfully moved out of his arms and loaded the food into the oven. Then she got to work filling the containers with cereal. Marcus carried everything for her, which was extremely helpful. As they set up the buffet table, Marcus found every excuse to touch her. So, what now? He asked as soon as Liz deposited the hot casserole dishes on the buffet table. The older children will help the younger ones get breakfast, Liz explained. As the door to the cafeteria opened and a teenaged boy led two younger boys into the room... Welcome, Keith, Tyler, Matt, Liz warmly greeted. Today we have cereal, fruit, and egg bake. Marcus assisted the teenager with making the plates for the younger boys and helped them get situated at a table. Liz's heart clenched at the sight of her friendly husband. He was great with the children, treating them with kindness and respect. Jill entered towards the end of the breakfast rush. She smiled at Liz, who was pleased that most of the egg bake was gone. Marcus stood beside her, his eyes watching the doorway. It looks like the egg bake was a hit, Jill noted as she made a plate. It was, Liz responded. Any luck on a chef? Jill's eyes lit up. I just got off the phone with a prospective employee. I'll be interviewing her today, Jill announced. Liz, thank you for helping me. It was my pleasure. Jill, don't be afraid to ask me for help in the future. Jill nodded and walked over to a table. Oh, what are they doing for lunch? Marcus wondered. You will help me make sandwiches for the kids. <laughs> Come on, Liz urged as she grabbed his arm. She led her husband back into the kitchen and grabbed the list with the school-age children's names. Marcus grinned as he snatched the ingredients from the fridge. Liz disliked the idea of making 20 sandwiches, but she figured that she could help. Does your bad luck extend to sandwiches? Liz wanted to know, which made Marcus laugh. No, I survived on sandwiches, Marcus explained as he washed his hands. After a moment, Liz followed suit, and they made sandwiches and packed bag lunches. That was a lot of work. Marcus commented as they strolled out of the building. It was hot, and Liz furiously wiped sweat from her forehead. She briefly longed for the right to drive a car. Then she promptly reminded herself that she didn't even have a driver's license. Are you all right? Marcus chuckled. 
That heat, Liz groaned. It just hit me. Concern flitted across Marcus's face. You don't like it here? He asked, which made Liz frown. Of course I like it here. You're here. She pointed out before squeezing his hand. Marcus's grin made her heart race. I'm glad to hear it, baby. I'm happy you're here. Do you think we can continue what went on in the kitchen tonight? He teased. She tried to fight it, really, but the blush nearly burned her cheeks. Funny, <laughs> she huffed. Do you... Liz stopped speaking. She blinked at a crowd of furious women that were standing outside of the processing center. Her heart sank. Please don't tell me that that crowd is in front of your processing center, Liz pleaded. They are, he confirmed. Let's go see what's going on. Okay. Do you think that this is something about me? Liz squeaked out. I don't think so, Marcus said. But if it is, I'm with you. Chapter 12 Liz and Marcus approached the small crowd, which consisted of ten pissed-off women. A customer practically had to shove through them in order to enter the processing center. Her instincts to protect herself nearly kicked in, but Liz bit her tongue, figuring that her husband could take care of things. Mrs. Blackhawk, what is going on? He asked. The rude woman from the museum approached, her head held up high. Well, young man, what are you going to do about this? She demanded, which made Liz suppress a massive eye roll. This woman was so dramatic. Please tell me what happened, Marcus encouraged. My Emily was supposed to get married to Paul Charlin. Paul decided that my Emily wasn't good enough for him and sent for a mail-order bride, she snapped. And what does this have to do with my husband? Liz challenged. The tall, beautiful woman scowled at her. Paul works for your husband's company. As a good, honest man, your husband can't employ such a dishonest person. Mary Blackhawk said, Anger filled Liz at the thought that a woman could order a man fired for jilting her daughter. Of course not, Marcus responded. I couldn't possibly have a man that does such a thing work for me. Marcus's words made her heart crack. I knew that someone like you would understand, Mrs. Blackhawk purred. Right, Marcus was rich so he could easily cost someone his job. This reminded her of why she ran to New Jersey in the first place. Liz had been a bartender for one of those bar and grill establishments back in North Dakota. She didn't find it strange that her boss only hired women to serve the customers. Liz had wrongly assumed that men didn't do those kinds of jobs. Sure, it was a stupid assumption. It wasn't until her boss Joe pulled her into the office that she understood the score. He had forced himself on her, and she had shoved him away. He had fired her on the spot. Her mother had thrown her out of the apartment, arguing that she was just another mouth to feed. If Joe hadn't been such a creep, Liz would have been happy in North Dakota. Her sister wouldn't have made an attempt on her life. She wouldn't have nightmares, and... She wasn't going to let this happen to someone else. Marcus? Liz said, gazing into her husband's kind eyes. Is Paul a good worker? Liz, not now, he gently warned. No, we will do this now. Is Paul a good worker? Liz demanded. Don't interfere in island business, Mary Blackhawk snapped. So, Mary, your Emily is okay with you interfering like this? Liz shot back. Where is she? Where is the woman who was supposedly jilted? Moments later, a short woman with black hair and tan skin pushed forward. Her eyes were full of hurt and pain. He promised to marry me, the quiet woman said, her voice quivering. Then he decided on a mail-order bride. Why? Liz demanded. 
Excuse me, Mary shouted. I don't think that you... Shut up, Liz yelled, her fury nearly making her see red. I'm talking to Emily. Let her speak for herself. It's okay, Mom, Emily said, her eyes pleading. She just wants to know what happened. Look, Liz, Paul abandoned me two months before our wedding. Why? Liz asked, pressing the issue. Well, because... He fell out of love with me. He... Why would you want to marry someone that doesn't love you? Liz gently asked. You did, Mary Blackhawk pointed out, which made Liz sigh. I'm a mail-order bride. Love between my husband and I is going to come in time. But you know him. You know that things will never work. Why risk losing a friendship with Paul by getting him fired? Don't you care about him? Liz argued. Of course I do. I've known him for 75 years. I just... Maybe we should go. Please, Marcus, don't fire him. Emily softly pleaded. I just want to stop talking about this. Don't listen to my daughter. Fire him or else I will make sure no one uses your processing center. I will apply to open one two streets away from yours. I will... You will do nothing, Emily shouted. Stop threatening Marcus. Stop it. Paul broke up with me because of you. He said that he couldn't bear eternity with a mother-in-law like you. He tried. He really did. Drew and Brody also passed on me for that reason. I just... (sighs) I'm going home, Emily said before storming off. The shock on Mary Blackhawk's face turned into anger. Marcus, your wife will know her place, she said. Come on, ladies. We have a business permit to apply for. As soon as the women left, Marcus let out a groan. Great, I'm about to lose my business. Good, Liz snapped as she pulled her hand from his. Marcus blinked in surprise. Good? You want me to be without means of supporting us? He demanded. That's no worse than what you were going to do to Paul. Maybe you deserve it. I can't believe that you were actually going to fire someone for Mary Blackhawk of all people, she complained. That's what someone gets for dating a Blackhawk. Paul knew the risks. It's like a common rule on Portham Island. Dating a Blackhawk can lower your job security. And you think that's okay? You think that it's right that she does this to innocent people? Why are you so complacent? You're playing into the scheme, you... Liz... How about you go home? I'll show you around the center when you calm down. The rejection hurt. Liz tried to force the tears from her eyes. Okay, fine. I don't go where I'm not welcomed, she said before heading home. Marcus rubbed his face as he entered the center, which was crowded with customers. He saw Paul behind one of the stations. He strolled over to the man, his intent to yell at him. But then someone grabbed his arm. Marcus glanced down at his unhappy sister-in-law. You are an idiot, she hissed. You aren't going to fire Paul. That's just stupid. Liz is right. Marcus nodded, ashamed that he was going to give in to Mary Blackhawk. No, I'm I'm not going to fire him. I... He looked around the bustling center, knowing that in three months all of it would be gone. He'd have to reinvent himself. But Liz was right, and he hated it. What's wrong? Esperanza softly asked. I think I need to go after Liz. I hurt her feelings when I canceled her tour. Well, then go after her, Esperanza prompted. Shouldn't I... Wait it out? He asked, not wanting to fight with Liz. Wait it out? You mean let her anger fester? She asked before giving him an eye roll. Let me help you out first. Does Asher know you're here? Why didn't he get your groceries? Marcus demanded. Because he's at work, I'm pregnant, not helpless. Marcus nodded but escorted his sister-in-law to an empty station. He checked her out, himself, 
before Packers filled her cart with food. He walked her home before going to find Liz. Liz was sitting on the couch watching TV when Marcus rushed in. He fell into the seat beside her, exhaustion filling his features. Can we talk? Marcus asked. Liz eyed him, concern on her face. Look, I get it. I wasn't supposed to say something to Mary Blackhawk. But even if you kick me out, I... Kick you out? Marcus asked, confused. You didn't want me at the center, Liz argued. Why? I needed some time to think, Marcus defended. Think about it, Liz. <laughs> You just jeopardized my business by yelling at Mary Blackhawk. I had to figure out how to fix it. So what? Are you going to ask me to leave? Liz snapped. Of course not, but I need to figure out what I'm going to do next, Marcus admitted. Trust me on it, fighting with a Blackhawk won't amount to anything. You run a good business. You won't lose it because of her. But you also won't compromise your values for your business either. Marcus rubbed his forehead, a headache plaguing him. It irked him because Liz was right. But if he agreed with her, then he'd have to acknowledge that in the past he had compromised his values. Don't worry, Liz suddenly said. I know exactly how to manage Mary Blackhawk. How? Marcus tiredly asked. We're going to talk to our family. I bet that your parents have a good idea, Liz announced before leaving the room. He could just hear his mother now. You should have fired Paul. I can't help you. Liz would be disappointed when she spoke to his mother, which embarrassed him. Chapter 13 the next day, Liz opened her eyes and let out a sigh. She was wrapped up in Marcus's arms yet again, since another nightmare had troubled her. It was disappointing that Marcus hadn't made good on ravishing her, but Liz couldn't help but think that it was for the best. She had been annoyed with him for the humiliating way he had dismissed her, but that memory was slowly fading as the need to be consumed by Marcus took over. Liz's lips gently pressed a kiss to Marcus's warm chest, which caused him to let out a groan. She lifted her face and made eye contact with him. What happened to having your way with me? Liz challenged, her heart pounding. Marcus took one glance at the alarm clock and let out a curse. That will have to wait until tonight. I actually have to be at the processing center today, Marcus complained. Liz sighed and rolled off of her husband, who reluctantly got out of bed. Tonight, then, Liz agreed as she contemplated what to make for dinner. If it was going to be their special night, she couldn't very well serve sandwiches. Are you going to visit my mother today? Marcus wondered. Is she at the ice cream shop? Liz inquired. Not this early, Marcus replied before walking toward the door. Well then, I might as well visit with her before I meet with Cassandra, Liz said as she walked into the bathroom. Liz wasn't overly optimistic or delusional. She knew that dealing with Catherine was going to be a challenge, but she hoped that the woman would see things her way. Liz mulled over how she was going to approach her mother-in-law as she changed into a blue sundress. She knew that Catherine was a prickly woman who didn't like dramatics, but she had to be agreeable to what Liz had in mind. Liz slipped into her sandals and made her way downstairs. Marcus was sitting at the table shoveling the last of his cornflakes into his mouth. He jumped to his feet and shot Liz a tender look. I've got to go. I'm running late. Good luck with my mother, he quickly said, then he rushed out of the house. Liz sighed and decided to skip breakfast. She wasn't all that hungry and didn't feel like eating alone. Liz sighed in relief when her eyes landed on Catherine and Darren's massive home. 
It was already 95 degrees, and sweat was making her sundress stick to her skin. Liz sucked in a breath before mounting the steps. She rang the bell and the door flew open, Catherine staring back at her with surprise. Are you pregnant? Catherine demanded, which made Liz blush. No, we haven't even... What in the hell are you here for, then? Go track my son down and seduce him. I want my grandchildren to grow up together, Catherine said. A lovely thought, but Marcus and I have a lot to work out, Liz confessed. And you came to me to talk about things? Catherine asked, incredulous. Why not go to Esperanza? Because Esperanza isn't a native of Portum Island, but you are, Liz clarified. Okay, come on in. I was just about to drink my morning smoothie. Want one? Catherine inquired. Sure, Liz responded before following Catherine into her spacious kitchen. Liz sat at the breakfast bar while Catherine filled two tall glasses with the contents of the blender. She placed one of the glasses in front of Liz, who immediately took a sip. This was a delicious fruit smoothie, not the nasty green crap that Nancy tended to make. Catherine plopped down across from Liz dressed in a t-shirt and shorts, which was casual but sensible for the weather. Tell me everything, dear, even why you utterly refuse to be intimate with my son, Catherine insisted. Liz blushed but complied with her mother-in-law's request. So, Mary Blackhawk wanted this Paul fellow fired because he jilted one of her spoiled daughters. That hardly makes sense, especially since Mary did everything to dissuade Emily from marrying him, Catherine commented. She can't win. Liz insisted. And how do you intend on facing off with the great Mary Blackhawk? Catherine asked, amusement flashing in her dark eyes. Liz considered the situation at hand, then snapped her fingers. A charity event, she blurted out. Maybe if the women can focus on what's really important, they will forget about Mary Blackhawk. No can do. She will plan an event the same day as your charity event. Trust me. Catherine warned. A charity tea party? Liz guessed. Same problem, Catherine said before taking another sip of her nearly empty glass. I got it, Liz cheered. I'm going to reach out to the common folk. How? Catherine challenged. I'm not sure, but I'll figure it out. Once you do, don't refer to them as common folk to their faces. They won't be happy about that. Catherine advised. I know, I just... Sometimes I forget that Mary Blackhawk isn't nobility, Liz confessed, which made Catherine nod. Enough about Mary Blackhawk. Why haven't you gotten started on my grandchildren? Catherine demanded, which made Liz groan. I just met Marcus. I don't jump into bed with strangers. And besides, it almost happened yesterday, then that fight happened. Liz pointed out before her cheeks burned again. I've hit a new low. I'm talking about my relationship with my mother-in-law, Liz thought to herself. Don't be embarrassed, dear. I have been married for hundreds of years. I am a wealth of information, Catherine bragged. How about a topic change? Liz desperately asked. Have you called the district attorney to get an update on your case? It's like this woman loved bringing up uncomfortable topics. No, but... Make sure you do that soon, she said. Fine, Liz said. Anyway, dear, I have to get going. Be sure to update me on your plan to campaign to the... common people, Catherine insisted. Liz chuckled before getting to her feet. Thanks for the smoothie, Liz said. It's no problem, dear. I would have poured it out otherwise, she said. The wastefulness annoyed Liz, but she bit her tongue and decided to go visit Cassandra. The commercial building that held the Portum Island Mail Order Bride Service was located in the center of the island. That meant that Liz had a two-mile walk to make. Despite the exertion, she was in good spirits. 
Catherine had seemed open to going toe-to-toe with Mary Blackhawk. She had listened to Liz with an open mind. Catherine was proof that not everyone on Portum Island was stuck in their ways. Her elation at making progress halted when her eyes beheld the crowd of thirty women blocking the entrance of the commercial building. Keep Portum Island safe! Keep the foreign brides away! Keep Portum Island safe! Keep the foreign brides away! Keep... Mary Blackhawk signaled to the group, who immediately stopped chanting. Good morning, Liz. Mary greeted a scowl on her face. Liz's heart pounded as fury filled her veins. This entitled witch was harassing people all because Paul didn't get punished for jilting her daughter. Don't you have something better to do? Liz shouted. Look at you, picketing a building because you didn't get your way. You are a pathetic, useless waste of space. Why haven't you put your energy into something useful? Have you volunteered at the orphanage given to the less fortunate or tutored school children? What in the hell are you good for? You heard Emily. Paul didn't want to marry her because of you. And all of your little puppets follow you around because they are afraid of you? You... Mary stepped forward and slapped Liz across the face. The pain brought Liz back to the apartment to the fear and helplessness that had briefly suffocated her. Then the rage turned into determination. She was never going to let anyone physically harm her ever again. But before she could strike, a gentle hand rested on her arm. She glanced down to spot Julia standing there, her eyes filled with anger. Look behind you, Julia instructed. As soon as the other woman released her, Liz turned to see three police officers standing there. Great. Mary Blackhawk was trying to bait Liz into hitting her. Liz was positive that this entire thing had been a setup. How Mary knew of Liz's plans was beyond her. Maybe Catherine had told someone? It could have been innocent, or perhaps the other woman had tossed Liz under the bus to save her own business. Liz wasn't sure, but was fortunate that Julia had come to her rescue. Good morning, officers. Liz greeted. I trust that you're going to break up this protest. Some people are interested in doing business today. The forced smiles on the faces of the officers confirmed Liz's theory. They had been hoping that she would lose her cool enough that they could arrest her. Will do. Run along. Liz, you should stay out of trouble, the blonde-haired officer said. It's Mrs. Lawson to you. Liz corrected before walking away from the crowd. Her head held up high. Liz hadn't noticed that Julia had followed her until she spoke. What are we going to do with that crowd? That gave me an idea, Liz said with a smirk. Two can play at her game. Chapter 14 Hi, Marcus. Asher said as he strolled into the processing center. Marcus, who still had no customers at his station, smiled at his grinning brother. He loved Asher and enjoyed seeing his brother's face filled with happiness. Emma had done a number on him. Emma. Just thinking of that woman caused guilt to surface. He needed to tell Asher what had happened and hope that his brother was happy enough with Esperanza that it wouldn't matter. Can you come over for a beer? Marcus wondered. I need to talk to you about something. Sure, is everything all right? Asher inquired as he fished his credit card out of his wallet. Marcus woke up his computer and pulled up Asher's order, a comforter that Esperanza had probably picked out. Now let me grab the comforter for you, Marcus said before he ran to retrieve Asher's order. His heart nearly sank when he returned to find Emma standing beside Asher. Asher, it's so nice to see you. I heard about Esperanza's pregnancy. Hopefully you'll be smart enough to hire a nanny for her. Brad just hired one for me. That's why I'm able to go out. Emma boasted. That's nice, Emma, Marcus commented, glad that Brad had taken his advice. 
Of course, that isn't what I want, but it's an upgrade. Emma huffed. What do you want? Asher asked, confused. Asher, your brother and I had a deal, Emma announced. If he got me off the island, I'd keep my mouth shut. Asher eyed Marcus with concern. Emma, you can't leave the island. The pain is too great for you. We've tried getting you through the barrier. Asher gently said, but Emma's eyes only flashed with anger. If I have to spend one more day with Brad, I think I'll scream. He is cheap, boring, and refuses to do anything exciting with me. I want off this boring island. Emma cried, tears beginning to stream down her face. If you can't pass through the barrier, there's nothing I can do, Marcus hesitantly said. Asher, Marcus and I slept together the night before our wedding. I left you for Marcus, but he refused to commit to me. He told me to marry you, but I refused. So I ran to Bradley, which was an utter mistake, since he's so dull. Emma complained. Marcus met Asher's eyes, which were filled with shock. It was like his brother couldn't process anything. It was a fling. Emma was never going to leave you for me. I was drunk, and she was available. I'm sorry, Asher. I was going to tell you. When? Asher demanded. When you came to my house for a beer. Look, you have Esperanza now. That wasn't important. Besides, she only slept with me so she could blackmail me for money. Marcus reasoned, which made Emma go bright red. I loved you, Emma cried. Marcus shook his head. I don't think you could love anyone, Emma, Marcus said, his honesty angering the dramatic woman. Whatever. I'll make sure that the entire island knows about what you did. Everyone will realize that you aren't the good man that they think you are. Emma shouted before leaving the processing center. Well, that's insane, Asher grumbled. You slept with my fiancé and never owned up to it? Look, I knew as soon as I sobered up that it was a mistake, Marcus defended. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I think I need a drink. It's like things keep on getting worse between Emma and me. Asher groaned before thrusting his credit card at Marcus. He knew his brother well enough to know that he needed space. Asher may have kept his temper on a tight leash, but he had one. Marcus processed his transaction, and his brother snatched up his comforter and stormed out of the processing center. It wasn't until the door slammed behind Asher that Marcus took note of the people in the room. Faces filled with shock, disgust, and curiosity stared back at him. It was the looks of disgust that he didn't think he could handle. Marcus had done everything to make up to the universe for what he had done to Asher, but it looked like this one mistake would still identify him. He wouldn't be Marcus, one of the generous benefactors of the orphanage. He would be Marcus, that guy who hooked up with his brother's fiancé the night before their wedding. Sighing, Marcus decided that the processing center didn't need him anymore. The inventory had been sorted into boxes, and none of the customers were eager to be served by him anyway. So he nodded at Kendrick and shot him a hand signal that they decided on whenever Marcus was leaving the running of the processing center to him. Then he rushed out of the processing center and nearly ran into Thomas Daly. Hey, Thomas, Marcus greeted. Hi, Marcus, is everything all right? Thomas wondered. Um, my brother found out that I slept with Emma the night before their wedding. You might as well hear it from me. Marcus sighed. Thomas frowned at the news as if he had trouble understanding its significance. But Asher didn't marry Emma. Why does it matter? Thomas inquired. Because brothers have a code. You know what I'm talking about, right? Marcus asked. I suppose. And the said code was broken, and now I have to tell Liz, who's already unimpressed with me for almost firing Paul. Marcus complained. Thomas nodded. It's best if you tell your lady ahead of time. 
You wouldn't want Mary Blackhawk tossing this gossip into her face, Thomas said, before heading into the processing center. Thomas Daly was not a meddler. In fact, he had too much drama in his life and so rarely got involved in the issues of others. But he felt that he could be of service in this particular situation. So after he dropped off his groceries at home, he made the trek to Asher Lawson's home. Thomas, it's so nice to see you, Esperanza said as soon as she opened the door. The uncomfortable expression told Thomas that he had obviously come at the wrong time. Esperanza, I know that Asher's upset. I just have some wisdom to impart to him, Thomas said. Esperanza nervously tugged on the strings of her apron, but stepped aside to let Thomas gain entrance. The home smelled of baking cake, which told Thomas that Asher's wife was attempting to lift her husband's spirits with food. Tessa would have used more physical means, but that was why his wife was more suited to him. He's in the living room, Esperanza said as she rushed over to the oven. Thomas strolled into the cozy living room and eyed Asher, who was on the couch drinking a beer. Get over it. Mrs. Adams is manipulative, just as my ex-sister-in-law once was. She sucks the life out of people. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if she had gotten Marcus drunk. Think about it, Asher. Marcus wouldn't have sought someone as annoying as Mrs. Adams out, Thomas lectured. Disgusted by his friend's despondent mood. Besides, Mrs. Adams was never going to marry you. She's a gold digger. And if Tripp slept with Tessa before your wedding day? Asher bitterly asked. Tripp did worse. He tried to poison me. Thomas fired back, making shame cross Asher's face. Take it from me. You hit the brother lottery with Marcus. Right. I'm lucky to have a disloyal brother, Asher hissed. The longer you stay upset about this, the longer your wife will be hurt, Thomas reasoned. Asher blinked, his eyes going wide. What does Esperanza have anything to do with this? She has everything to do with this. Women are weird creatures. Asher, I bet right now she's thinking that maybe you're upset because you have feelings for Mrs. Adams, Thomas argued. He hoped that the tactic would work. Marcus was a good fellow. He was one of the only islanders that didn't give him odd expressions. And plus, he had been willing to offer Kendrick a job when the man needed it. Esperanza knows that I'm madly in love with her, Asher argued. Thomas only had to arch a brow in order for Asher to suck in a deep breath. Marcus betrayed me, Asher said. He did you a favor. Mrs. Adams is miserable. Could you imagine being married to a woman who drops her baby off at someone's house with no supplies because she doesn't feel like being a mother? Thomas said as he plopped down on the couch beside Asher. He had a feeling that convincing Asher was going to take a while. The man was too focused on his anger to see that Marcus was worth forgiving. Chapter 15 It was sunset by the time Liz stumbled into her home. It took hours, but she managed to make headway. Her entire body ached from walking all over the island. The purpose of the day was to recruit islanders for her mission. Liz hobbled into the kitchen and spotted Marcus sitting at the kitchen table with his head in his hands. She immediately knew that something was wrong. Liz limped over to Marcus and placed her hand on his shoulder. What happened? Liz asked, thinking that he had lost the processing center. I care about you, Liz. You know that? Honestly, ever since you came to this island, it feels like everything has become bright and exciting. I don't want to lose you. But I think once I say this, you will pull away from me. What happened? Liz asked through a tightening throat. <sighs> Before Asher and Emma's wedding, I slept with Emma. I was stupid. I got drunk and one thing led to another. 
I regretted it as soon as I was sober. I didn't tell Asher about it because I didn't want to hurt him, so I kept Emma quiet with bribes. But then she asked for something I couldn't deliver. She asked me to help her get off the island. Because I didn't deliver, she told Asher what happened, Marcus said, which made Liz groan. And now everyone on this judgmental island is talking about you? No wonder why some of the women that I spoke to today gave me pitying looks. I have no idea how to respond. Liz confessed, her mind spinning. The Marcus she knew was thoughtful and cared deeply for others. How could he have made such a terrible mistake? You talk to people on the island? Marcus inquired, sounding interested. It's a pet project I'm working on. So have you made up with Asher? Liz asked. He left the processing center before we could work things out, Marcus admitted. Well, it's getting late. I'm guessing that Asher's probably settling down for dinner. If I were you, I'd give it a day, Liz suggested. I guess you're right, Marcus said as the doorbell rang. Liz let out a groan and rushed over to the door. She quickly opened it to find Emma on the other side, tears streaming down her face. She didn't have any patience for the broad. You need to help me, Emma cried. Brad fired the nanny. He expects me to stay home. He said that hiring the nanny gave me more opportunities to cause trouble. I need to help you, Liz asked, confused. The crazy broad wiped her tears and glanced thoughtfully at Liz. I need to divorce Brad. He isn't making me happy. Emma complained. And what does that have to do with me? Liz wanted to know. Emma cast her eyes to the ground and began to fidget. Unease filled Liz as Emma let out a breath. Mary Blackcock promised that if I helped her, she would donate a house to me. But she backed out of the deal after Diana Adams found out about it. You were the only people that I have left, Emma pleaded. How did you help Mrs. Blackhawk? Liz demanded. The doorbell rang, and Liz had the feeling that she didn't want to answer it. Uh, it's too late, Emma cried. Liz shoved past the hysterical woman and opened the door to find two uniformed officers standing on her doorstep. Liz Lawson, you are under arrest for theft. Marcus glared at the desk officer, a thin blonde-haired guy with a horrid sunburn on his forehead. All he wanted to do was get everything straightened out. Why couldn't the stupid punk call someone with more power? Mr. Lawson, the judge won't hear Mrs. Lawson's case until tomorrow, the officer said, annoyance on his face. This was a setup. Like, Liz has never been to Mary Blackhawk's house. Oh, why don't you listen to what Emma Adams has to say? Marcus suggested. All he could think about was Liz, alone, frightened, and in a place where she didn't belong. This was all his fault. If only he had handled things with the Blackhawk sooner, Liz wouldn't be in lockup. Marcus glared at Emma, who was sitting in one of the plastic chairs in the waiting room. The venomous woman was crying, as if she were the victim. He wanted to shake the annoying woman, but knew that the act wouldn't accomplish anything. All he could focus on was what would happen if Liz were convicted of a crime. She could be deported from Portham Island. He could lose the woman of his dreams because of a petty woman who didn't like when others argued with her. Marcus knew that he'd never leave Liz to her fate. He would follow his wife wherever she went. You can come back tomorrow. That's when someone will be available to speak to you. Marcus Lawson was getting something that anyone that crossed Mary Blackhawk got. The brush off. I'll be here first thing. Marcus warned as the door to the police station opened. I'm sure you will, the desk officer said. Marcus turned and saw Asher standing behind him, his eyes filled with sympathy. One of Dad's golfing buddies told me that Liz got taken in for theft. Thanks to Emma. 
She snuck Mrs. Blackhawk's ring to the cleaning lady who stashed it in the sugar bowl. Marcus reported. Asher's eyes narrowed. I used to love her, he admitted. Marcus's gut turned because he now understood what love felt like. I know. Oh, I shouldn't have done that to you, Asher, Marcus said. Asher shook his head and pulled Marcus into a tight embrace. She isn't worth it, Marcus. Chapter 16 Liz stood and began to pace. In the way of jail cells, Portham Island criminals had it good. The place wasn't technically a cell. The officer that had led her into the temporary abode referred to it as a holding room. It had no bars and the small window provided a view to the parking lot. The bed was a full size, which was dressed in rich purple sheets, which made her think that a high society woman had complained about the accommodations offered to her while she was in lockup. This island was full of ridiculous people that could never hack it in the real world. Who in the hell got so worked up about an argument that they tried framing someone for theft? History had done Liz wrong, considering that another argument centered around history had also cost Liz her job. She groaned and stomped her sock-clad foot against the linoleum floor. What in the hell was she going to do if the judge decided to deport her? Apparently, since Liz wasn't a native, she could be kicked off the island if it were proven that she committed a crime on Portham Island. This island could do with a few reforms. An idea popped into Liz's mind. Change. That was probably the key to making a difference. But what was the point of trying when she was going to lose her husband? Marcus. The thought of walking away from him made her heart shatter. She couldn't lose the guy who had comforted her after horrid nightmares, taken her to museums, and put up with all of her shenanigans. He cared about Liz and had truly wanted to know her. Liz didn't know many people back in North Dakota who would have bothered taking her to a history exhibit. He took an interest in what was important to her. Liz smiled at the memory of Marcus helping her make sandwiches in the orphanage. Would he leave with her? Liz had no idea, but she would try to make the case. Holding on to the knowledge that she wouldn't lose Marcus, Liz plopped down on the bed and began to plan. The next day, the door flew open and Asher stood in the doorway with a wide grin on his face. He was dressed in a black suit and blue tie, and his hair was combed to perfection. That was most likely Essie's doing. His wide grin perplexed Liz. Do you secretly hate me? Liz blurted out. Because I don't see why you're so happy. Emma and Kara both admitted to their part in the plan to get you tossed off the island, Asher announced. They spoke to Judge Simons earlier this morning. Then Cassandra Hall went down to the council and argued that mail-order brides are citizens, so they should be exempt from the threat of deportation. And? Liz asked, her heart beginning to soar. Well, uh, mail-order brides can still be deported, but just for severe crimes, Asher announced. We have plenty of time to alter the law. So I can get out of here? Liz shrieked. You can get out of here. Asher confirmed with a wide grin. Liz ran to Asher and tossed her arms around him. She quickly pulled away and eyed her socks. Can you please get me some shoes? Liz wanted to know. Asher nodded and left the room. He entered moments later with the bag that contained the clothes and footwear that she was wearing before the police officers had arrested her. Asher stepped out of the room and closed the door so that she could change. After changing out of the bland gray shorts and top and back into the sundress and flip-flops that she had come in, Liz strolled out into the hallway and followed Asher out into the sunlight. Marcus placed the last of the roses into the vase that sat on the kitchen table. 
The smell of lasagna filled the air, and a bottle of plum wine was sitting on the counter. Esperanza had just finished cooking that night's dinner an hour before. He had planned a couple of days of wooing for his bride. It took one sleepless night for him to realize that he needed to have a real marriage with the woman that he loved. He had also acknowledged that he had done nothing to show Liz that she was appreciated. He hoped that she could truly see that she was in good hands with him. The front door crashed open and two seconds later arms wrapped around Marcus. He held Liz close, his face pressing into her hair. I missed you, Marcus softly told his wife. I miss you too, Liz responded. I'm glad to be out of the slammer. I'm sorry for what Emma did. And don't you worry, I fired the cleaning lady. What's going to happen to them? Liz wondered. Marcus wanted to curse at the injustice. That biased judge declared Emma's actions the actions of a distressed woman who's in an unhappy marriage. How could a man of law be so casual about the framing of an innocent woman? Well, that was probably because Judge Simons was good friends with the Blackhawks. Nothing. I'm so sorry, Liz. So many things need to change about Portham Island. Mary should never have been able to frame you just because you had the courage to stand up to her. Women like her have been given too much power, Marcus said. Liz held him tighter, her grip soothing the aching of his heart. If things go on like this... You will probably lose the processing center, Liz warned. I know. But at least I will still be married to you. I love you, Liz, Marcus softly told his bride. I love you too, Liz replied. Now, take me to bed. Hi, Nancy, Liz said the following morning. The new cell phone that Marcus had surprised her with was pressed up against her ear. It took little effort to convince the prosecutor to coordinate a phone call between her and Nancy. Ugh, this is all a big mistake. I can't believe that this is happening to me. The prosecutor won't accept anything less than 30 years. I'll be old by then. I won't be able to get married, to have children, to live. I'll be an old lady by the time I get out of prison. You have to ask the prosecutor to go easy on me. I'd do it for you. The words were painful, but Liz had to hear them. She eyed Esperanza, who was sitting beside her on the couch. Liz had finally told her what Nancy had done. The two cried and held one another, shocked that someone that they both had loved could do something so despicable. Had James Nelson succeeded, I never would have had the chance to grow old. Liz fired back as the first tear fell. Nancy, I would have done anything for you. How could you do this to me? Esperanza handed Liz a tissue and she furiously wiped her face. I'm sorry, Liz. I wasn't thinking. Craig left me and I was going to get nothing in the divorce. I didn't know what to do. I'm glad that James didn't kill you. Please, forgive me, please. Make everything right? For a moment, Liz felt guilt. She hadn't been killed. Nancy shouldn't have to miss out on a life with a husband and healthy children. But then she reminded herself that people like Nancy never changed. If she didn't hurt Liz, it would be another unsuspecting victim. I'm sorry, Nancy. I can't do that. Just take the deal. If this goes to trial, you could get worse, Liz warned, her voice quivering. All you have to do is say something. And while you're at it, tell Mom to get me a lawyer. I'm sure she could open up a credit card, Nancy said. Nancy, take the deal. I'm sorry, I can't help you anymore, Liz said before hanging up the phone. Well, that's over. Liz said as the last of her tears fell. I'm so sorry, Liz, Essie said. I still love her, Essie, but she's selfish and cares for no one but herself. 
I think one day I'll stop feeling guilty for not speaking to the prosecutor on her behalf, Liz said. But what hurts more is that she'll never feel guilty for what she did to me. Before Esperanza could say a word, Julia and Tessa hobbled into the room, grins on their faces. We have recruited more people, Tessa said. Liz, this is a wonderful idea. It looks like life is moving on, Liz told herself. I'll have to leave Nancy in the past. Let's just hope that my plan won't give Marcus a heart attack, Liz said. Epilogue A month later, over 500 women marched down the sidewalks of Portham Island. They were organized in two columns, each column marching on either side of the street. Liz was front and center, with a pregnant Esperanza at her side. Liz had tried to talk the woman out of the mile-long march, but she wouldn't hear of it. Liz was tired of the Blackhawks, who had just filed their petition to open up a processing center. Liz knew that if she didn't act, things would only get worse. The council's building loomed ahead, with Kevin and Thomas holding the double doors wide open. Let us be heard! Let us be heard! Let us be heard! Liz shouted. Soon the women joined in. Liz marched into the council's building, her column following right behind her. She entered the auditorium where the council meetings were held. She strolled down the aisle and glared at a stunned Mary Blackhawk, who had been about to start her presentation. Let my story be heard, Liz shouted. Mary Blackhawk was so offended by my behavior that she had my cleaning lady plant her ring in my sugar bowl. She then called the police and they arrested me. I was nearly deported. Let me be heard, Liz yelled. A short woman with long black hair stepped forward, her face filled with determination. My name is Hilda. I used to be Mary Blackhawk's maid. When I refused her husband's advances, I was fired and blacklisted from working, Hilda shouted. Many women who previously suffered in silence spoke, their anguish making Liz's heart ache. The councilman sat there, stunned into silence. Liz eyed Mary Blackhawk and watched as the woman paled. She had never counted on her cruelty being brought into the light. After the fifteenth grievance against her, Asher stood. Mary Blackhawk, I speak for the council when I say that your petition to open up a processing center is unnecessary. To Liz's surprise, the councilmen all nodded eagerly. It was then that something occurred to Liz. It was evident that the men of Portham Island didn't know what to do with the mob of angry women. But, sir, I come from a strong and proud family, and... So then act like it, Councilman Terrors yelled. For goodness sake, Blackhawk, do the honorable thing and stop flexing your power. I will have your job, Councilman Terrors. I will ensure that you're removed because I am powerless. Now shut up and let men do men's work, Councilman Terrace snapped. Okay, that attitude had to go. Liz eyed the table and thought that someday she would occupy a seat. In the meantime, she seriously needed to gather another angry mob. There needed to be stricter guidelines when it came to adopting children. Liz decided that this particular fight would have to be won in another way. She eyed Asher who was madly in love with Esperanza. Her kind-hearted brother-in-law was her way in. The End This has been Liz, Bride's Dock on Portham Island, Book 4. Written by Debbie Civil. Narrated by Bethany Kay. Copyright 2020 by Debbie Civil. Production Copyright by Debbie Civil.